welcome to the 2023 MUSA practicum final presentations. Um, for those of you who are joining um, in person or online who are not familiar with this course, this is a year end um, capstone course, which is a client based data science studio for what we like to call in our program applied social science. Um, so we have seven teams of three students, each of them working with a client in the nonprofit or public sector to try to solve a complex problem uh, using often administrative or open data that relates to what these organizations do in their public mission. So this is really different than a studio using similar technologies or methods that you might see in say a business school because we're trying to train the next group of civic technologists uh, to solve society's problems and optimize not for dollars and cents, but to optimize for public benefit, um, which is a far more difficult thing to do with data science and requires a complex understanding of things in the world and not just technologies. Um, I'm very, very pleased uh, in with this year's group of students, it's always quite, um, I'd say a leap of faith that we all take together where we've set up some very ambitious projects and we feel pretty certain that they're going to work, but really it's up to the students to understand if they can work and then how they can work. And somehow we, they always do, even though at the beginning of the year, we take a bunch of metal and we throw it off a cliff and we agree that we're gonna build a flying machine before we hit the bottom. Um, and somehow we haven't lost anybody yet. Um, so I'm really grateful to the students for all the effort that they put in and all, all the faith that they put into um, the process that we put in front of them. Um, I'm also incredibly grateful to our clients, many of whom are joining us uh, online. We have, we spend about six months before the beginning of this class uh, each year developing these projects and um, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful that these clients also take a leap of faith that we can try to help them solve a problem, even if sometimes they don't necessarily understand uh, in detail some of the things that we're proposing. Um, but I'm incredibly happy that there are certain municipalities, certain organizations that we work with year after year. Um, and uh, I want to thank all of the clients for all the time that they've spent with me and then later with the students to put these projects together. This would not be possible whatsoever without them. Um, I would also like to thank uh, Matt Harris. Uh, Matt Harris uh, has been teaching this class with, with me for, I think it's maybe five or six years now. Um, I would also like to thank uh, our late friend, Ken Steiff, for putting this class together. Um, and I'd also like to thank our wonderful uh, TAs, both from the fall and during the spring semester. So Aiden, Shinje, for helping uh, put the projects together and then get the class to run and doing the course logistics. Really appreciate that. Oh, and lastly, uh, Patrick and Kate for helping us put this event together. Um, okay, so we have seven presentations, seven groups, and seven is a strange number and we've been struggling with the scheduling all semester to try to make seven fit into three hours, um, but we'll try again. Um, each group will present their project for 15 minutes and subsequently, we'll have five, six, seven minutes for questions, um, which will come first from the client, but then from, from any of you here. And we have a microphone uh, because those in the Zoom audience won't be able to hear unless you have the microphone. So if you have a question, you can raise your hand and we'll give you the microphone so that uh, everyone at home can hear you or in their offices. Um, Matt will be monitoring the chat. So if you are on the Zoom, um, feel free to drop a question in the chat and Matt will, will also collect those and prompt uh, the students with those and we'll try to get to as many of those as time allows. Um, so I'm trying to think if there's anything else logistically that I'm missing. Uh, I don't think so. So let me introduce the seven projects that we have and uh, the clients and then we'll turn it over to our first group. So uh, Group number one is working with uh, the lab in DC, 
which is a data science group in the mayor's office. Uh, and they built um, a, an optimization system for uh, vermin screening in Washington, DC. Um, we have a group working with the Philadelphia Fire Department to understand and forecast the community impacts of structure fire. And thank you very much to the fire department. It's our third year working with them. Um, we have two projects with uh, the Office of Transportation Infrastructure and Sustainability, OTIS, uh, with the City of Philadelphia. Um, one is a forecasting tool to plan the bike share expansion for the Indigo system. And a second one is an optimization system related to um, some of the new planning that's going into uh, bus transit in Philadelphia. Um, we have a land use change forecasting model from the, for the Chesapeake Bay region. Thank you to Hampton Roads uh, Planning District and the U.S. Forest Service for working with us on that. And we lastly have a housing displacement information system uh, and our partners in that are community legal services in Philadelphia. So there's one I've forgotten. Oh yes, I did. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Um, and lastly, a repeat client um, and uh, hello to uh, Alex Hoffman, if you're listening uh, or while you're on leave, um, we have a forecasting system for some bus transit alternatives in El Paso, Texas. So thank you to the Capital uh, Improvements Department, uh, the Planning Commission in uh, El Paso. So um, I will turn it over to our first group, which is the a vermin inspection optimization tool um, please, again, make sure you're able to speak into the microphone so that uh, we can uh, make sure those at home can hear. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm Kate Tanaby, and this is Henry Feinstein and Eric E. And we um, are excited to kick off this year's practicum presentations with Rat Screener, a vermin inspection optimization tool for DC. So before getting started, uh, we want to echo what Michael said um, and thank our client for the project, the lab at DC. Um, and we especially want to thank um, Ren Masari and Peter Casey and Kevin Wilson for all of their guidance on this, and especially as we've taken a bit of a different angle um, to this problem. So our team, um, Henry's been leading our app development. I work on the project management side, and then Eric has been leading modeling and markdown. Okay. So diving in to our use case, um, for Rat Screener, uh, we aim to develop a vermin inspection optimization tool that increases efficiencies within the DC Health Department by prioritizing inspection requests based on the likelihood of rat detection on a given block. So talking about the problem a little bit more and how we identified our use case, um, I think we all can agree rodents thrive in cities. Um, infestations can be really costly to local governments though. and so. Rats are most commonly associated with sanitation problems in cities, and that's certainly true, but they are also um, can cause structural damage um, by burrowing in streets and buildings, which can lead to the loss of businesses, homes, um, and other community assets. Uh, they can also cause power outages, internet blackouts, um, and fires by gnawing on gas lines and wires. And of course, um, they can pose a risk to public health as they can contaminate food and carry pathogens. So, that's a little bit about how much of a nuisance rats can be. Um, turning to DC's experience, um, in 2021 alone, DC received over 12,000 requests for rodent inspections. The problem was that they only had eight vermin inspectors. And so this current approach is really inefficient. Um, not only can the inspectors not keep up with the sheer quantity of daily requests, but they rely on personal knowledge and ad hoc decision making. Um, and so they aren't really able to formally prioritize requests in any way. Um, and lastly, a lot of the record keeping is done on pen and paper. And so ultimately these inspectors um, have a wealth of knowledge and are professional and environmental knowledge and are really important assets to the city. But even they find that the number of um, requests that actually lead to rat detection when an inspector arrives is only 46%. And so we hope to develop a tool that can provide them um, some help in using their knowledge in tandem with the tool to efficiently abate the city's uh, vermin issues. And so the solution um, is RAT Screener, which is short for the Rodent Algorithmically Targeted Screener. It's a predictive model and web app that uses spatial, historic, and environmental data to um, 
estimate the probability of rat detection and allow for more targeted inspections. So um, a quick high level overview of rat screener. We, um, starting out here on the left-hand side, we use blocks as our unit of analysis. Um, we chose this based on what we know about rats, which is that they rarely cross streets and they stay pretty confined to their colonies. Um, in the middle for our data, we've been using a data set from our client that has over 11,000 311 requests for inspection. Um, and so each of these inspections are um, associated with an outcome. So we know if an inspector went out and found rat activity or, or did not find rat activity. We also have a data set of 100 field validation test points. So these are locations that did not place through one requests, um, but were randomly um, inspected instead. And then finally, we also collected um, additional data for our variables. And then finally, the results generated from Rat Screener will enhance um, the current rodent management prog program, help inspectors prioritize requests, and ultimately save money, time, and resources for the city. So um, a quick overview of the actual process behind Rat Screener. Um, so first, we gathered and assigned variables of interest to each block in DC. Uh, we then built and ran a few models, which we developed using those variables to calculate the predictions for each block. Then we categorize each block based on the prediction probability. And then as new requests come in, they are assigned a priority based on their blocks probability. And finally, that prioritized list is uh, displayed for inspectors. And so we wanna focus a little bit more on these um, outcomes here. So essentially what happens when we run the model, each block is assigned a priority based on its probability of rat detection. And so um, the blocks are categorized by low priority, which would be blocks that have that we predict have a probability of rat detection from zero to 20%. Medium would be 20 to 60% of probability of rat detection. And high would be anything up beyond 60% and up to 100%. And so it's important to note that this is a proof of concept um, project. So ultimately these numbers can be adjusted, um, but this is how we have used it so far. And so as an example, um, let's say a new request is submitted from 1223 14th Street. Rat Screener would associate that address with the block ID. Um, and then it would identify the probability associated with that block, um, with that block's outcome. So in this case, block 3485 has a probability of 87.79% um, of rat detection. And then this request would be labeled as high priority and presented to the inspectors. So moving back um, a little bit and looking at our data, we started this process uh, with some internal research and looked at our data that we were given. So this first map shows, um, locates each of the inspection requests in the city between 2015 and 2018. Um, and then you can see in this middle map that a lot of these requests align pretty closely with the population density in DC. Um, and this last map on the right shows a little bit more of the spatial process of rat detection in DC. So here we calculated the distance to the nearest rat detection hotspot. Okay, moving along. Um, so we used um, or tried to use quite a few different spatial, built environment, historic and climate um, variables when we tried for rat screener. Um, and so we incorporated each of these into the model, but ultimately some of them provided some more critical information about the spatial process of rodent um, infestation than others did. And so we ended up using these highlighted um, variables, which included nearest instances of rat detection for each block, distance to rat detection hotspots, uh, rat detection history, the number of construction permits on the block, the number of storm drains, um, the zoning, and then the count of residents per unit. And so we incorporated all of those into our models. And um, as I mentioned, we started by associating each of those spatial, historic, and built environment variables to each of the blocks. We then built a preliminary model and predicted the probability of rat detection on each block. We then evaluated the model for accuracy. And so in this case, accuracy um, is the number of correctly predicted blocks divided by the total number of blocks in DC. And that gave us accuracy as a percent value. And so this process has been very iterative and we continue to try different models, different combinations of variables and different optimization levels. Um, and so optimization allows us to improve the overall effectiveness of the model with, um, and kind of also gives us an opportunity to target more specific outcomes and benefits. 
So we started that with a cost benefit um, analysis and we were thinking through a framework that associated different costs with the predictions um, when they're right or wrong. And so an accurate rat detection prediction could be associated with some costs such as um, inspection and, and um, treatment costs, inspector salaries, um, their time, gas and vehicles, um, but these costs are pretty minimal compared to the potential savings from avoided infrastructure and public health issues. So things like avoiding uh, potential damage to buildings and sidewalks, removing the risk of fire or power outages, and limiting exposure to um, potential health contaminants for the community. Um, alternatively, there are also higher costs associated with um, inaccurate rat detection predictions. And so that could be deferred infrastructure maintenance that might be missed without a proper inspection. Um, undetected infestations could lead to further structural issues, um, have sig significant impacts on health. And um, also inspectors might feel as if they've maybe wasted time and the city ultimately loses money. And so with this in mind, we optimized the models and landed on a threshold of 20% for our data set, meaning that the blocks with over a 20% probability um, of rat detection would be considered likely to have rats. Um, and most importantly, um, using this 20% threshold means that we can kind of keep the cost as low as possible and the public benefits as high as possible. And so we repeated this process a few uh, different iterations until we were ultimately able to select the model with the highest accuracy. <laughs> um, and so we selected a support vector machine model, which predicts the probability of um, rat detection as we've discussed. And we found that our model had um, an overall accuracy of 72%. Cool. Moving on to our predictions. So um, this map on the left shows the probability of rat detection for each block in our data set. Um, and we can see how many blocks fall into each of those priority levels. Um, so in, in this case, there were 28% of the blocks were categorized as high priority, 47 as medium priority, and 25% as low priority. And then we also aggregated this up to the ward level um, since inspectors often work um, in specific wards. So here you can see the different um, average prediction pr probability by ward. Great. So um, when we were evaluating our model, we had to look at some different uh, types of outputs from Rat Screener. So we are four separate um, options here. So the first one on the very left is where Rat Screener predicts there would be rat detection and inspectors went out and indeed found rats. Um, the second option would be we predicted no rat detection and inspectors did not detect rats. Um, the third would be that we predicted no rats and the detect uh, inspectors did find rats. And then lastly, we predicted rats and they did not find rats. And so based on all these thresholds and <clears throat> the optimization processes that we discussed, these first two categories are where um, essentially the model is getting it right. And so here's a breakdown of all of our predictions that Rat Screener made. Um, and you can see that we're reaching that 72% accuracy when we total these first two categories, which are the correct, uh, correct predictions. Um, in addition to our overall accuracy, we found that our model does pretty well at classifying positive rat detection cases. Uh, we found that of all the blocks in DC that had an inspection that led to rats being detected, Rat Screener was able to predict 86% of them correctly. And of all the blocks that Rat Screener predicted would have rats detected, 71% were correct. And then we also assessed our model for generalizability, which is um, essentially how well the model works on new data. Um, and we found that, again, of all the blocks in DC that had an inspection that led to rats being detected, um, we were able to protect 87% of them correctly. So a slight increase from just looking at um, the model singularly. And then um, we also found that the percent of negative rat detection predictions were a little bit lower. Um, so the model definitely does better at predicting on blocks that have had rat detection but it still performs very well. And then um, we also looked at how our model performed um, across different districts spatially in DC. And so here are some um, prediction accuracies by ward. And we can see that the overall um, accuracies remain pretty high across each ward, um, ranging from 80 to 95%. And this is particularly important because DC is pretty spatially segregated by both income and race. 
So we were glad to see that rats, the rat screener model was you know, able to um, perform relatively uniform across those factors. And so we took all of our predictions and we used them in the rat screener app, which um, is designed for vermin inspection inspectors to use while in the field or on inspection visits. Um, and they can use the app to view prioritized inspection requests and um, locations, review notes from prior inspections, and also view the rat detection and 311 request hotspots. So I'll turn can, it over to Henry. Sure, I can very quickly walk through our app if I can get the mouse to work. Oh my God. Um, so as Kate mentioned, you know, we wanted to keep this app really straightforward because it's not in intended to replace the job of an inspector, but just to be a very easy to use tool that they can maybe glance at in the morning before going out for the day. Um, so typically, if you have an inspector assigned to a ward, they'll, they'll receive kind of the uh, inspection requests from that ward, and they have to just go out and decide which ones to go to first. And the idea behind this app is to give them a quick way to understand how they might go about their day in an efficient manner. And so when you boot the app up, it shows you this map of DC separated out into the blocks that are a unit of analysis. Blocks that are highlighted in red are the ones that um, have, have kind of received an inspection request in some window of time. And you know, since we're actually right now still working with this older data, 2018 data, it's not live and up to date, um, but we actually are working on that for another uh, course that will be integrated into the app eventually. Um, but the idea here is that you know, an inspector may be assigned to a certain ward, say ward two, and you know, this, the app will kind of help you focus in on what you're looking at. And then once you're here, you can navigate to a given block and when you click on a block, it will show you um, kind of when the last inspection happened, uh, any notes from the last inspection that will be helpful context for the inspector to know before going out. And then the, the outcome of our model, which will give them a sense of how highly they should prioritize this particular location when they're going out for their day. And then the final kind of feature of this uh, app, which might help inspectors prioritize their work is actually um, kind of and the ability to show these fishnets for hotspots, for instance, where 3 and one calls are most commonly seen throughout the city. Areas in blue are areas where 3 and one calls come from the most. And this can help an inspector prioritize the calls maybe from more of an equity perspective. If they see that there are inspection requests coming from areas that don't typically get a lot of 3 and one calls, may indicate that they should uh, check out those areas first because um, typically speaking, um, you know, you're working against some equity challenges and who's actually willing to call 3 and one for treatment of an issue like a rat infestation. That's basically what we've got uh, for that. And I'll go back to the slide. Awesome. And so just wrapping up here, um, we have learned a lot from working with DC and rat screener. Um, first, obviously rodent infestations are really serious and can have huge costs um, for cities and communities. Um, building on that, inspectors are very important, knowledgeable assets to cities. And finally, incorporating spatial data can go a long way um, to improving model performance and increasing efficiencies in an inspection system. Thank you. Testing, okay. Besides access to the relevant data, what are the data science challenges to doing a more fine-grained analysis and uh, being able to predict the type of damage that is likely to occur? This seems like something that you might wanna do if like, you know, like cutting power lines is like probably a huge deal compared to some other damage. That's a good question. Um, you know, we as generally speaking had a tough time with the quality of the data for this project. I think when you're relying on three on one data, you're relying on a lot of kind of conditional probabilities, right? Of the, the probability of someone seeing a rat in the first place, deciding to report it, the inspector showing up to the right place, actually seeing the same rat, right? And so I think when it comes to something even more granular, like what the specific kind of damage which is happening, I think if anything, you'd have to rely on like the written notes from inspectors that um, you know the office records. And maybe that would involve some kind of text analysis, which you could combine with spatial patterns. But um, it's just really hard to know when you're relying on the reporting of evidence as opposed to like going on the street yourself for kind of ground truthing of where the rats actually are. Um, but I can imagine, you know, doing some kind of text-based work to see if you could find patterns in the kinds of damage happening. If 
thank you so much. I, I enjoyed your presentation. I, I really like uh, the name that you came up with as well. It's really clever and Michael. and uh, <laughs> yeah, it's super well done. Uh, my, my question is about what happens after detection and how that relates to the modeling process. Uh, so in particular, how, how do you address whether a site's been treated or are you able to do that? And then over time, could you wind up with a situation where like the model gets increasingly inaccurate over time as places don't get treated because they're not tested to the same degree? Yes, I think certainly. I think something when we were speaking with our client, we found that it takes on average at least four visits over a month to fully eradicate a, um, a rat colony. So it takes a lot of um, things beyond, I think, this app and our model to actually follow up and fully um, kind of eliminate the issue. Um, but in terms of our modeling in the app, we were kind of planning that this would be a little bit iterative. And as, you know, as inspectors are able to input new data and talk about their um, upcoming uh, requests and how they responded to them, that that could be fed back into the model. And ultimately, it would be ever evolving pretty much. And I just have a quick follow up. So, so is whether a place has been treated in the past, does that feature into the model or, or not? Um, the detection history does. So if they've had like a detection uh, inspection that led to detection. Um, that was a great presentation. I, I really enjoyed it. I, I learned a lot um, about a topic I really didn't want to learn a lot about, but uh, great <laughs> job. And what to me made the presentation so great is that I think you could give exactly this presentation to everyone. You could give it to city government, you could give it to the rat inspector, you could give it to lay people, and they'd all understand it at exactly the level you wanted them to. So terrific job. I do have three questions. So the first was, um, how did you choose this? Were you were there like seven choices of projects and you were the last or did you actually want to study rats? But that's it in jest. My, my, my first serious question is, um, could you tell me a little bit more about what you're estimating? engine was? Was it a maximum likelihood or low jit or something like that? Because I, I think, you know, the, the the results look great, but they're only as good as the estimating engine. So that's a simple question. The other question is a little harder. Um, I don't know a lot about this topic, but I imagine um, in some ways there's it's analogous to crime. So we worry about that if you stop crime in one location, it just moves around. So is your procedure capable of of uh, uh, looking at that to say, uh, if you treat a particular block or a house on a block for rats, then maybe some of them end up passing away, passing on, but others just move over to the next block. And so the, you, you'd actually see an increase in rat activity to adjacent block, or in other words, spatial autocorrelation. So have you thought about that? Maybe take a crack at the second one then turn to you for the first. Do you want to first? Oh yeah, we have tested five models such as a random forest uh, log logistic models. And uh, from the probability distribution, the SVM is the best model to our project. So uh, uh, support vector machine, yeah, SVM. And I think in terms of your second question, uh, the truth is rats are such a major issue in a place like DC that I think the goal of a model like this is never to Er eradicate them it's more to apply city resources as efficiently as possible i think um i is probably outside the scope of this work to say whether a prolonged like highly efficient inspection and treatment process would actually get rid of rats in a place like dc um, i think you could certainly record the results of this modeling over time and and see what's happening in terms of how rats are getting redistributed but i think as I was mentioning before, this is also like crime in that it relies on reporting and relies on actually knowing where it's happening. And I think totally separate from the modeling itself, like the city is probably far behind in understanding where the rats even are to begin with. And so this is, you know, all the inspectors can do is react to where people are reporting it. And so I think understanding a pattern like where the rats are going once you get rid of them in one location would be pretty, like would take a much longer time, I think, and a lot, maybe even a lot more resources for the inspection office to kind of get to that point from what we understand about their current resource level. Thank you very much. All right. We, we shift to oh, there's one in the back. Oh, do we have time? Oh, Sophia. Okay. I 
I like when you broke down the error. I remember we learned about that in class. And I was wondering if you looked at the error in terms of like space or like income brackets or something to see if like the error was even across or like there wasn't an inequity in how accurate the model was in different places. <laughs> um, we did a very kind of lower level uh, I would say analysis of that, uh, mainly looking at making sure that accuracies were not, you know, completely different across um, the city, especially with DC when like it's very segregated um, in terms of residents. And so I would say short answer, yes. Long answer is that it probably needs a lot more um, work for that. And good job too. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, fire team. Uh, I usually don't do extemporaneous pattern in these presentations, but I will say with the RATS team, I'm, Matt and I are extremely proud of the fact that the professional data science team took a crack at this problem using the same data set. And we saw it and we thought that this was not done to the standard that we would teach in this program. And so a number of people with, with PhDs did a pretty good job, but this group of people did a much better job by making this a, a spatial model and so we're really happy with with their work so congratulations on that today we're going to be presenting on understanding and forecasting the community impacts of structural fires um oh that yeah to begin my name is kendra this is myron and this is ben and um we'd like to just give a, a shout out to the philadelphia fire department um, specifically Kathy, Andrew, um, Andrew, and Commissioner Adam for their support and guidance on this project. Um, and a special thanks to Red Cross House who were really implemental with our anecdotal and qualitative research. Um, and they're doing great work in Philadelphia to help uh, victims of fire. And so with that, we will get started. Um, in 2022, uh, there were 1.2 million structure fires across the country. Um, last year, major cities like Philadelphia and uh, New York City were grappling with severe and deadly structural fires. Um, specifically in Philadelphia, 41 individuals lost their lives, uh, 200 were injured, and um, 2,000 were displaced. Um, and so the PFD has come to us and they, um, they express the desire to learn about the social and economic consequences of fire incidents in the city. Um, and this is really to better um, form strategic thinking and programming around um, fire prevention and fire recovery patterns. Oh, okay. So there we go. Sorry. <laughs> Technology. Um, so as it stands, the Philadelphia Fire Department has very limited knowledge on what happens after their job is finished. In fact, this is the first project and the first of its kind to predict um, after fire outcomes. And so, um, again, this is to really inform the, the PFD's desire to understand and predict the consequences of fire incidents so they can better understand recovery patterns. And so we came to this um, oh, there we go. Um, we came to this analysis um, with talking to the Red Cross. Um, they specifically told us that fire victims' biggest worry and biggest goal is to get back into their house as quickly as possible. And so this is obviously not a quick, ta a quick task. And it's often due to the level of severity of the fire, whether they have savings or resources to get back into their home. And so out of the available data that we had, uh, open data, we decided on these three um, outcomes. And so permits for us signaled recovery that the resident was able to get back into their homes, whereas vacancy was more as an obstacle to getting back into their homes. And then we decided to look at property transfers or the sale of a home as kind of a middle ground. It could be good, it could be bad, depending on the context of the neighborhood. And so those are our three outcomes on how we are going to predict the, um, the, uh, the outcomes of the properties uh, at, at the property level. And so we had the pleasure of being given proprietary data from the Philadelphia Fire Department. It was really rich and extensive and dated back to 2009. And then of course we used external data sets such as ACS, 301 data, license and inspection data, 
um, and property transfers um, to uh, start our analysis. And so when we started looking at um, the data and really unpacking, we really came across one property in particular that really illustrated that those three outcomes of property or vacancies, um, transfers, and um, oh my gosh, we're my third one. Permits, sorry. <laughs> um, those three outcomes were illustrated within one property. So we're gonna just walk through that neighborhood really quick. So this is the property just one um, one month after or one month before the fire. And then this is taken um, one or one month after the fire, after the fire occurred. And as you can see, it just so happened that the Google Street car was passing by um, that the house was going through repairs. Um, and so moving on, the property and near properties, as you can see, now there's vacancies on both sides. They sat vacant for a number uh, uh, a number of years. And so uh, while it sat vacant, it received multiple 301 complaints of vacancy. So we're kind of already seeing this pattern. And so in 2022, um, the property uh, was sold for nearly $80,000. And then it was sold again, sorry, 2020 was sold for $80,000. And then 2022, it was sold again for nearly $250,000. And actually the other house to the end was sold for even more for $300,000. Um, but they had different um, property developers, but um, we'll get into that a little bit later. So um, yeah, this is just really to go, to go to show how those outcomes can display themselves within um, one property, in this case, one, one block. Um, and so with that, we're going to pass it over to Ben to continue our exploratory analysis. Thanks. So I'll run through the exploratory analysis and talk about our findings. Um, so we started with the fire department's data set um, and, as a, to see if there were any signals that needed to guide our research. Um, looking at fire frequency uh, in that data set, saw that there was no large seasonal variability when you aggregated all fires together. Um, most buildings that were in that data set uh, only had one fire, small fraction had two or more. Um, and those most frequent fire locations tend to be large properties like mixed use buildings, multifamily condos, or uh, school buildings. And so those locations with uh, three or more were outliers, so we removed those from our analysis. Another important part of the data was fire severity. Um, you know, in studying impacts of fire, fire severity is important because the more severe the fire, the greater the impact and the harder it is to recover. There were multiple measures of severity in the fire set. We looked at four damage percent, there was the source of the fire, and then there's the CAD Nature Dispatch Code, which is like the one to five alarm fires you might have heard about. But the most relevant and complete was fire spread. You have one? Thank you. Um, you'll see the rapid fire spread here. Uh, on the right, you, um, so fire spread is defined as the relative area uh, that the fire was confined to before it was put out. And you see those different categories here on the right. Um, and then you see the distribution uh, for all those fires of those different severities uh, labeled with the y-axis on the left. This data set or this variable was great for us. And that, although it had some no records uh, that we had to remove from our analysis, uh, there were properties at at least you know a couple hundred properties at every single severity. And so it allowed us to have a good sample moving forward. From there, uh, we moved on to our open data variables and resources. Um, so again, we were looking at repairs, sales, and vacancies. Um, and in order to see whether these hypothetical outcomes had uh, any relation to fires, um, we used a propensity match data set. Um, that set uh, matched 12,000 properties that had fires um, individually to uh, 12,000 properties that didn't, and they, each pair had similar qualities. Um, and then we took the uh, different reports of repairs, sales, and vacancies for each of those pairs and matched them to the, um, uh, and we sorted those reports into buckets, depending on how uh, dis how far in time the uh, reports were from the time of that one property's fire. Um, and we figured this analysis is going to show us if uh, fires have an impact on repair sales or vacancies, then the properties that had fires are going to have a different pattern than the properties that didn't. And so we'll show you our results from that. So here we're looking at um, a graph of permit request counts. Um, for these two different groups. On the x-axis, we have the, um, the relative years from the fire, um, and that goes up until zero on this graph, and that uh, time of the fire is represented by that orange dotted line. Uh, the y-axis is the count of outcomes, in this case, permit requests. And so you can see that properties with fires and properties that uh, didn't have fires had about a similar rate of about 50 uh, permit requests per quarter. Uh, 
up until the uh, time of this fire. However, after the time of that fire, um, we see that the uh, properties that had fires have a much greater likelihood um, of having a permit request taken out. This spike exists for about a year and a half, and then this elevated rate continues for about four years. Um, the properties without fires showed no similar pattern. And so we think that this illustrates that fires are associated with a uh, increase in repair likelihood. We have a similar graph for sales. Um, you can see that properties without fires are experiencing a, just a slow increase over time uh, in the amount of sales, and that's just the Philadelphia market. But you can see that with properties with fires, there's still like, fires are still associated with at least a 40 to 50 percent increase um, in property sales for those for properties that had a fire, and, and that trend continues for at least three years. Um, finally, we have vacancies. Interestingly, uh, with vacancies. Um, properties that had that were going to have a fire uh, have an increase in the amount of uh, vacancy reports leading up to that fire, and that matches uh, research that we found that uh, vacancies are often a fire risk. Um, and then, same as the others, uh, we see that fires are associated with a, a sharp rise in likelihood of vacancy reports, um, and then that trend continues uh, for four years. Now. Um, it's nice to know that there are these uh, that fires are associated with a sustained likelihood of um, these outcomes. But uh, to give the fire department the most information about whether they are going to impact different areas differently, um, we thought that giving the prediction on a certain house uh, at any given time is going to be most helpful. So I'll pass it to Myron to give information about the forecast process. So for our project, we are predicting probability of these three outcomes happening to a property within the next two years. And we started off with a trial run of the generalized linear model or the GLM model. And we found that from our results, it was pretty inconclusive regarding permits and transfers. So we decided to put these two into the random forest model. And in the random forest model, it actually performed a lot worse. So this allowed us to go back into the GLM model with a different approach. So we utilize a cost-benefit approach, which allows us to balance the sensitivity and specificity rates of each model to get the optimal thresholds. And by that, we wanted to create a better modeling experience for all three outcomes because all three are very nuanced and require different sets of attention. So we needed to kind of separate them and create very unique uh, experiences. And first, we were able to predict the probability of a vacancy within two years at an accuracy of 62%. And the variables highlighted in orange are the variables that we use for our model. But I want to make a special note that this is the only model that had some sort of spatial relationship with the distance to schools being a very significant variable for this model. And next, we predicted the probability of a permit happening within two years at an accuracy of 64%. And unlike vacancies, there's no spatial factors here, but what is important is that in addition to property and fire data, this is the only model that required a lot of census variables to be used. And lastly, again, like permits, um, transfers aren't that reliant on spatial factors, but what stands out here is that this is the only model that relies pretty heavily on property characteristics. And to recap our modeling process, each model has very unique variables and profiles to each one of them. So in addition to fire and property data, you can view each model as vacancy being one that is more spatially oriented, permits being one that's more people oriented, and transfers that are one that's more building oriented. And across the three outcomes, <clears throat> the constant variables were fire severity, months since fire, owner occupancy, and the average income. But we acknowledge that our accuracy rates are a bit low, and we believe that that is due to data and accessibility. In our meeting with the Red Cross House, we found that, or we learned that the cause for a vacancy permit or transfer could be attributed to these variables, which are insurance, landlords, and social relationships. So if we had any data pertaining to that information, we probably would have had a lot better models for each one of them. And to wrap everything up, we are predicting every outcome on every residential property in Philly in two years but we're doing this through the framework of the fire severity level. So we want users to understand at their property, what will be the likelihood of a vacancy permit or transfer happening at different fire levels. So here's a demo of kind of how this looks like. 
Yeah, can you press it? <laughs> so you first you're brought to the landing page and then you press on search the forecast and enter in any random address. And right now we set our fire severity level at three. And it tells you that at this point, there is a medium chance of repairs happening and a high chance of sales and vacancies happening. But once we close out, we're able to change the severity level to a different one. So in this demo, we're gonna test it at a level five. And here we find that all outcomes have a high probability of happening. And then you can also find out the case study that Kendra walked us through earlier to get more information and more details. We are also brought to the recommendations at the end, which is sort of our pre and post fire interventions that we are proposing for the Philadelphia Fire Department. And I'm gonna give it to Kendra to give us more detail on those recommendations. Sweet. So to conclude, um... We're supposed to do that. <laughs> Thanks, Ty. Um, to conclude, we again separated our recommendations into before a fire occurs and after a fire occurs. So to start with our um, pre-fire interventions, um, the first is home ownership and renter um, renter insurance. We heard time and time again that insurance is a barrier. A lot of people do not know or have knowledge that renter insurance is available to them. And so starting off with um, with really educating the community, specifically in areas with high vacancy rates about um, homeowners uh, and renters insurance. Next slide, babe. Um, again, we heard anecdotally that local landlords and developers are really crucial to um, getting repairs done. Um, one of my favorite quotes from um, uh, an employee from the Red, House, Red Cross House was, um, never get a landlord in New York, because um, oftentimes there's a disconnect with, the, with, with residents who need um, repairs done quickly. And so we really wanted to incentivize uh, more local land, landlords and developers within the city of Philadelphia. Our next strategy is single room occupancy and uh, safety. So we found that some of the most vulnerable residents of Philadelphia usually use uh, um, occupy these um, types of housing because it's most affordable. Um, and these residents are most vulnerable to a fire incident occurring. So really um, prioritizing um, this population is important to um, honestly save, saving lives. Um, and then the last recommendation is proactive home repair. This is very obvious. Um, obviously, we want to, um, Philadelphia has an older housing stock, and so really um, proactively uh, getting a lot of the wiring done and the common electrical problems fixed early on is crucial. Um, Post-fire recommendations, lowering cost of repairs with, again, programming using um, habitat humanity model, things like that. Um, keep going. Um, decreasing investment risk because kind of goes similar to similar models, finding um, um, programs like low income housing tax credits to really uh, incentivize um, developers to uh, fix up uh, fires post post fire. And then incentivizing local development along the same lines that I mentioned earlier, if developers are here, they can fix the property after a fire a lot faster. Um, and so with that, we are finished. We conclude. Thank you so much. And we really hope this helps. Thanks very much. Questions? Do we have some questions from the client, Matt? Uh, so clients, I know some of you are on, on the uh, Zoom. So if you have some questions, please put them in the chat. Do we have questions from the audience? Eugene. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Uh, great presentation, really interesting study. Uh, I have two questions. So the first one is really who was included in these analyses? I know you said that you excluded large multi-use uh, buildings such as schools. Uh, you excluded uh, apartment buildings. Did you include standalone commercial buildings? Did you include duplexes and stuff like that? So that's the first question. The second question is, uh, I guess, to elaborate a little bit about the issues that you had with the uh, with your random forest and why that didn't work and why you chose the other approach. Thank you. I think as far as what we included, uh, we took out um, a lot of the buildings that were labeled as condos um, because they um, had a difficulty uh, labeling it or getting a sense of whether they were owner occupied and we couldn't get a lot of the variables there. We did include a lot of the mixed use uh, things. Um, basically, if anything had a category in like OPA data of either um, single family or multifamily or mixed use, then we were able to uh, uh, include those. We took out a lot of the other vacants um, and other categories, more commercial things. Um, yeah, and we can talk more if you're curious. 
Um, and for the random forest model, our accuracy rates for permits and transfers are, I, I believe, like 20 and 25% respectively. And I think one of the downfalls of our process was that our trees were set at 100 and we could have put a lot more, but it did take a lot of processing power for our computers. Um, so it was kind of a struggle against time. So we kind of decided to just use 100 because it was pretty comfortable to use and it wouldn't keep us back from going on the rest of modeling. Um, I, I have a question actually. Um, can you explain a little more, you had a lot more exploratory analysis, a lot more detailed than other groups. So I feel like with your, uh, modeling process, you went through it with a relative amount of speed. You had also a lot of outcomes. Can you explain a little more about the use case and the user associated with making these predictions and how those predictions are related to your, what you learned in your exploratory analysis? Yeah, so our use case was really based off of the fire department really has no idea what happens after their job is finished. And so if they did know, there could be some sort of intervention post or pre uh, pre a fire incident. And so we looked at um, permits, uh, vacancies, and sales as a way to, um, I, I feel like there are a number of outcomes we could have used, but based on the data we had, that's what we decided to go on and using those um, uh, those outcomes as predictors of recovery and or um, abandonment or lingering abandonment, things like that. So I think that's how we, our process of tying things together. But Ben, do you want to say more on, no? Okay. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. We have a question from Yes, from um, Zoom, Kathy Matheson says, uh, did you find any models for post-fire recovery programs in other cities? Um, we looked at a lot of cities that had a lot of post-fire recoveries with wildfires. There's a lot of happening on the West Coast, but there are some repair, lots of repair programs and um, that are very similar to the ones already happening in Philadelphia, um, based on my research. Did you find any yeah. in other cities? Um, Regarding the wildfires issue, I think there's a, a big wealth of knowledge and conferences happening around like, what do you do for a large scale emergency recovery? Mm -hmm. And there are some lessons that we can take. Obviously not all of those lessons apply, um, but for instance, there's a um, an organization called After the Fire uh, that hosts a, an annual conference um, about fire recovery or fire safety and, and prevention in terms of like more of the Californian uh, protecting them, themselves from wire fires, um, but some of their uh, advice with emergency financing or how do you get people into um, renters or uh, re rentals that are affordable quickly and those being critical, um, we think that that applies to both cases. Another question from Zoom from Andrew Newell, uh, who says, great job. I agree. Did you find, did you have any difficulty matching PFD data to other open data property based data? And yeah. subsequently, did um, demolitions get covered under permits? The demolitions are included in the, the permits. So yeah, the, but there, one could say that the demolitions are a step toward recovery, especially if the um, permits are not or if the fire is very severe. Um, we didn't have trouble matching the addresses in most cases. Um, however, we, uh, let's see, we did have difficulty, um, I think with some of the, the OPA data more so. Another question from Andrew. Did you look at any other socioeconomic factors of the neighborhoods that had fires? Um, based on what we were doing, it was primarily just the average income, race, age above 65, and poverty. We were trying to do a bit more, for example, like the percent of population that changes that's white within the census tract, um, but that didn't seem to be an important factor in our modeling. Thank you very much. I think we have to move to our next in our next group, just in the interest of time. Sorry if there are any lingering questions you can ask the group when we have wine and cheese at the end. But thank you, fire group. Great job. Hello. Yes. Uh, 
Good. Nice. Well, welcome to wow, this is loud. Um, welcome to our final presentation on evaluating and forecasting for Philadelphia's bike share expansion. Um, quick little introduction of the team. We have our brilliant um, Mark. Well, no, we have our brilliant machine learning lead, Rebecca, our wonderful web app developer, Min, who's trying to change the slide. And then myself, the project manager. I'm just going to wait for Min to change the slide so this makes more sense. So this is us. Wonderful. <laughs> Um, agenda for the day, we're going to introduce to you all of the clients we've been working with over the semester, and then of course the use case for our project, and then ultimately the goals or the outcomes um, of what we're hoping or we have achieved. Um, our final deliverable was our web application, the Indigo Expansion Planner. We'll give you a little demo or introduction to what we've been doing, and then finish things off with what's been happening underneath the hood or behind the curtain in terms of data exploration and the modeling component. So we've been working with the Office of Transportation, Infrastructure and Sustainability, along with their bike share operator, bicycle transit systems, as they've been wanting to expand the Indigo bike share system in Philadelphia while optimizing for ridership, accessibility, and equity. So we've created a tool to evaluate different expansion scenarios across these three metrics. So to clarify, we're not telling them where is the best location to place a new station. Instead, we've created a tool to allow them to hypothesize a new location and there's a B our app would allow to output these three different metrics. So ridership, we'd be predicting demand, um, accessibility, which here we've defined as the total population with access to at least one Indigo station within a five minute walk. And then equity, just to ensure that access to the Indigo network mimics the Philadelphia's racial and socioeconomic makeup. Um, we figured it'd probably just make more sense to just dive straight into the demo to give you a, a bit of a glimpse of what we've been working on and make more sense of the three metrics. So let's start planning. So this is our web application um, front page. Just click the first button, go to planner. There's a set of instructions, uh, but because I'm here and we'll explain it to you, I can just close that out for now. Um, and we can just zoom in and explore the different components to our map. So in the dark blue dots, these are the current Indigo bike share stations. Um, if you hover over any of them, it'll give you a bit more information on the ID, the address, the ridership with average weekly ridership and uh, the date or the year it was made active. The shaded blue area is the accessibility area. So as I previously mentioned, we defined accessible as with being able to walk to an Indigo station within five minutes walk. So this is what the blue area um, means. If you forget what it means, don't worry. There's a little legend on the left-hand side. To also help with your um, hypothes hypothesizing of new locations, we've created three different layers, uh, which you can turn on and off by clicking the three buttons on the left. The first is the expansion plan layer. So these are Indigo's current priority zones for new Indigo bike share stations. We have some areas in Center City for high ridership infill, some areas on the fringe, and some areas in light green um, for new expansion zones entirely. Um, if you would like to see the predicted ridership across the whole of Philadelphia to see where there's likely, or we're assuming there's going to be more demand, you can click the layer on, which the darker the color, the higher the demand or predicted demand and then population to be able to see where are there are areas of more high density. So let's assume I am working at the Indigo office for a day. Um, I want to place a new station in South Philly. Let's zoom into Pashyunk Avenue. Pashyunk, Pashyunk, still don't know how to pronounce that. We can just click straight to the map. So a new station will appear. Um, it's in a little blue donut shape. Um, and as you can see, the accessibility area increased the ridership increased by roughly 500 um, rides above the, 2000, the 2022 baseline data. Accessibility increased by roughly 5,500 individuals with access to the network, and the equity also a change. So here you can see the percentage of racial groups um, within the accessibility zone and compare it to the whole of Philadelphia's. So you can go around, just click as many stations as you like or as you see fit. So click, 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 click. Um, if you do make a mistake, please don't worry. There is the delete buttons um, here on the right corner. And you can see these metrics once again will continue to change. 
Um, once you're happy with the configuration of your new stations, um, you can feel free to save it by clicking the download button on the bottom. And you can then just bring it back into the map by importing it. Um, it downloads as a GeoJSON file. And yeah, and that's our app. Um, so what's been happening underneath the hood um, this whole time? Let's go back to the presentation. So in terms of data exploration, we obviously looked at Indigo ridership data. Um, so here is the ridership per week per station. As we can see in, in Center City, uh, stations tend to have high, higher ridership per week. Uh, we also looked at number of stations accessible within biking distance over time. Um, as well, unexpectedly, as the, you increase the time, <laughs> um, you also increase the, the um, accessibility geography. Uh, we also looked at the average ridership of stations around others. We also looked at the number of docks and the distance between stations. We also looked at some other spatial data, um, as previously mentioned, accessibility of stations. So once again, in the light blue, this is our accessibility zone. Uh, we also looked at distance to various amenities and services and other infrastructural components. So here, for instance, is the high injury network, but we also looked at uh, distance to parks, restaurants, tourist attractions, grocery stores, bike network, and other modes of transportation. So SEPTA, Metro, and bus stops. Um, we looked at these amenities and services uh, within walking and biking time intervals, and also the number of jobs available within a certain biking distance. We also pulled in some census and LEHD data, uh, predominantly to look at accessibility through uh, or by racial group, by medium household income and employment rates. So looking at the histograms here, we can see that those who have access to the network within that five minute radius tend to be predominantly white, have higher income and are, have a higher rate of employment and compared to the rest of Philadelphia. And lastly, we ran a correlation analysis. Um, so this is kind of a lot for a slide, but essentially it's ridership per week as a function of various features. So here, for instance, for the number of jobs within a 20 minute bike ride, we can see that ridership increases as number of jobs increase, which suggests that potentially people are using the bikes to head to their um, location of employment. Um, and here, for instance, as the distance to a subway stop increases, the ridership decreases. So potentially maybe, maybe people are using Indigo to get to another mode of transportation. And with that, I wanna hand things over to Rebecca for the meat of the project, Maudlin. Sure, thank you, Aiden. So you may have noticed uh, when you saw a brief glimpse of our app that there was a grid of blue squares covering Philadelphia. And there's a really important reason for that. That is our analysis grid, and it helps us understand how ridership varies uh, in space across the city. Each grid cell is a thousand feet square, which is the industry recommendation of the maximum spacing between stations. Uh, for our modeling, we gathered Indigo's 2022 ridership data of more than 900,000 rides over the course of the year. We aggregated this down to 183 stations and 162 grid cells, which are mapped here. And so this became our primary data set that we used to build and train our models. Ultimately, our models are predicting for the average number of rides per week per grid cell. Um, to do this, we use a combination of 15 different features, which are summarized here on this slide. Uh, it includes the demographics of a grid cell, the grid cell's proximity to different kinds of infrastructure, um, a couple of features of stations within a grid cell, and the number of amenities available via biking or walking distance from a grid cell. Uh, we tested eight different models in our process, and I'm not going to go into the details of them here, uh, but suffice to say we found a winner with um, the last model, which is an XGBoost Poisson model. Uh, we evaluated these models in a couple different ways, starting with their accuracy. This plot shows um, for our four top performing models, which were Random Forest, XGBoost, Poisson, and our XGBoost Poisson model, how they performed in terms of their mean absolute error. And so as you can see, our final model uh, has the lowest error rate at 40.5, and that indicates that our model's predictions were off on average by about 41 rides per, grid, per week per grid cell. We also evaluated these models in their generalizability, that is their ability to accurately predict on new data across space. And so these four maps show for our top four performing models, what was the mean absolute error um, of each 
model's prediction per grid cell. And so the darker the blue, the higher the error rate. And you'll notice that for all four of these models, our errors are concentrated in center city, which is the area where most rides occur. Um, and so these are largely proportional to number of rides that we're seeing in that area. Um, we did choose Exubus Poisson because there is a little less dark blue in that area. Um, and we're not seeing you know, other pockets of that elsewhere in the city where we wouldn't be expecting to see that. Finally, one of the best ways to see how our model is performing is to evaluate it on brand new data. And so we're really lucky. Uh, two very important things happened in the last week. First of all, it was Indigo's birthday. So happy eighth birthday, Indigo. Um, but the other thing is that Indigo published its 2023 quarter one data of ridership for the first three months of the year. And during this time, Indigo built 23 new stations. You can see them highlighted on the map here in green. And so we wanted to see for these 23 new stations, how well did our model perform um, in predicting their ridership? Um, and I'm happy to say that our mean absolute error in that prediction uh, is 19.8, which means that our model was accurate and um, its predictions were off by about 20 rides per week per grid cell. And you'll notice again that our errors are again concentrated in center city, an area where we tend to see more ridership. And we think, you know, there's a pretty easy explanation for this. Our model is predicting the, uh, for the average number of rides per week per grid cell aggregated over the course of a full year. But of course, the actual data that we're using here is from three months during you know, the coldest time of the year when ridership is at its lowest. And also some of those stations were only around for a couple of weeks and they haven't, you know, they're not, they're not up where they're gonna be. Um, so we're confident that um, our predictions in this area were over predictions. And we believe that as the weather warms up and there's more ridership um, that we'll see more accuracy with our model um, going forward. Finally, we fed our entire grid into our model, assuming one extra station per grid cell, and that all the stations within those grid cells were present for a full year. Fed that into our model, and here are our results. So this map shows where our model predicts are going to be areas of high and low ridership across the city. The darker the blue, the higher the ridership. Now you'll notice that the center of the city, not just center city, um, is entirely blue. Um, and that's because it predicts that's where the most ridership is going to be. However, there is still variation within this area. And we've included this inset map here to show how that ridership does vary. Ultimately, this is the prediction that powers our app and provides predictions um, for planners using it. And with that, we wanna say thank you. We'd like to especially give a huge thanks to our clients at Otis and Bicycle Transit Systems. We really appreciated your time and support and insight over the course of the semester. And we would also be remiss not to thank Matt and Michael for your support this semester. This project wouldn't have been possible without you. So thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, while we're waiting for some questions to come in from the clients, are there questions from the audience? We have a few. John, I missed you last time, so you can go first this time. Oh, okay. Um, great job, guys. <laughs> this is great. Uh, as a non-MUSA folk, I am very curious to hear about what these models that you were comparing are, and I feel like it came up a few times in these presentations. So, like, like, what are they? And how are they inherently different from their like performance? The eight models that we, yeah, like you guys ended up with the XP, right? Or something, yeah, but we did. I don't know what the question was. What a huge question. Um, <laughs> yes, we tested eight different models. Um, they're all different ways to try and, you know, approximate figures based on that exploratory data that we did. Um, you know, so they try and approximate these numbers in different ways. Ultimately, we landed on the extra boost Poisson, which is an extreme gradient boost um, machine with a Poisson distribution, which is optimized for uh, predicting, thank you, which is optimized for predicting um, the counts of something across space. And so that was very relevant for us predicting the counts of rides. So very Uh, really great presentation, really incredible app, and uh, really impressive selection of models. Uh, I have just one question. So you mentioned that the 
uh, average mean average error was about 20 uh, with the new data, correct? What was the average value of the number of rides per cell per week? Just to kind of compare that 22. So in, because 20 might be a large error or a small error, but just a relative uh, error would be helpful. You're, so you're talking about from the new data? Uh, yeah, just on average, how many rides per week per cell were there? I'm in the sorry, city. I don't remember that off the top of my head, but I would be happy to look mm -hmm. that up after this and let you know. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I thought that was a really great presentation. I really like the decision that you all made to present the app first and then use that as an entryway to discuss the models. I thought that was tremendously helpful and it made me really enthusiastic for the work. I guess I wondered uh, whether you early on you thought about maybe flipping the problem and trying to create the same sort of modeling procedure to identify those places that would um, maximize some objective function. Let, let's say like to jointly uh, increase ridership by to increase ridership citywide by some number and to increase uh, participation by uh, minority riders and maybe increase accessibility. I wondered if you could think about either using this app or something like it to sort of figure out where the next um, Indigo station should go. I mean, so this was a big discussion at the beginning of the semester is like either we go this route in terms of how, where to op, how can we op, create a tool to optimize a station location, how to tell them where to be placing these stations or kind of investigate scenario planning. Um, and so after discussion with our professors, we figured this is potentially more manageable during the scope of this semester. Um, so that's why also because Indigo currently has their priority zones, they already know that they're gonna be placing these stations in these areas. So we figured it might be best to provide a more evaluatory um, final web application, but that would be something that'd be really cool to do in the future if I have the time. Um, I'm kind of curious, could you expand a bit on how you guys are doing the equity calculations? So I'm kind of curious about whether these indigo stations are really used by working class people and whether they're not just for mostly for leisure. So, if I can, so you, we don't know ex obviously exactly the, the race or the ethnicity of every single user, um, but we do know who lives within a certain um, distance from the different stations. So after speaking with uh, Bicycle Transit Systems and Otis, they said that they're, how they view equity is ensuring that the network or those with access to the network, that racial makeup or composition is similar to that of the whole of Philadelphia. So we, if you were to read it for the equity component, it's for the residents living within that five minute radius, how does that racial makeup compare to the whole of Philadelphia? And then try, as you hypothesize new locations with our tool, you can start to see whether they start to approach each other or not. But it's just, you can't gather that data on individual users for privacy reasons, obviously. Okay, great. A uh, question from Zoom from Andrew Newell. Were you able to see where a ride was generated uh, to and to where it ended up? Uh, yes, we were. Um, our data set was very, very rich, and I feel like there are so many avenues that we could have gone down. Um, and so we did do a preliminary analysis of where trips were starting and ending, and it was really neat. Ultimately, we didn't move forward with it for the rest of our modeling, but, you know, that could be a really great source for, you know, future research. Thank you, I really enjoyed your presentation. I, I particularly like how well integrated the app and the predictive uh, model is. Uh, I can see that being really useful for planning staff and also just for, for citizens or advocacy groups uh, thinking about advocating for, for stations. Um, I had one, one question about um, like part, there were parts of the city, like particularly in the Northeast where ridership predictions were pretty high and they're really dissimilar from anything in your in your test group. And I was wondering uh, how you dealt with that or if you addressed it in the modeling at all. Uh, yeah, there are spots that we were surprised too to see like high ridership areas. Um, 
in a couple of those areas, those tended to be closer to either parks or um, bike lanes. Um, so we could see that there was a reason that that was chosen. Um, but if, if we go to the slide with the whole map, thank you. Yeah, um, you'll notice the middle of the city is entirely blue. Um, and that's because there's a huge uh, scale um, effect happening here. Um, and so while there are, those are areas of higher ridership compared to areas around them um, in the north part of the city, um, but they're not necessarily the highest of the, of the entire city and the highest would be where the Indigo network kind of already is. It's a function of that. We, if I oh, go for it, Laura. Well, I was just gonna add also having spoken with Laura and Ian, um, we do know that as you expand the Indigo network, you have to do it incrementally. So even though maybe your ridership seems a little bit high, as an internal user who will be using from Indigo, they know that they can only be slowly and expanding through this zone either way. So we're less concerned about this at this stage. Yeah. I should have spoken into the microphone. Thank you so much. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Laura Culp. I'm the planner for Indigo Bike Share. So I work for BTS. Um, I'm also a Penn grad. I got my MCP here in 2019. Um, first off, this presentation was wonderful. We really appreciate all the work you guys have done for us. Um, one thing that kind of building off of what Eric said, um, one thing that I think is interesting about this is that if I remember correctly, you said that this was built based on the idea that there's one station in each of those squares. Um, and one thing that's interesting that we've learned from Indigo internally is that um, this type of use in those really dark areas really has to come from a network. So just looking at this map, going out to these areas, sticking one station in would not necessarily perform to this level. It's very much about having that integral network that allows people to get from one place to another because bike share is very much an O&D situation. Um, overall, I thought it was a great presentation. Thank you guys so much. Your presentation was a little short, so we've had lots of good questions, So, I, which is fine. That's no problem with that. I have a question for you that piggybacks on this. Can you talk a little bit about the heterogeneity of existing stations and how they relate to the network? Because I remember there were a number of clusters that you identified where there were different stations that kind of serve a different purpose for different user groups, and, and they were interest, interesting qualitatively. Are you talking about... Why we gave up on Mount Airy. Why did you give up on Mount Airy? <laughs> so I just can talk about the model, how it did it work at that. Yeah. Yeah. So we recognize in our modeling and in talking with Laura that it's really important um, for indigo stations to be located near other indigo stations, that there is a network effect happening. Um, and the more we saw in our modeling that you know the more ridership there was in an area, the higher the ridership there was at a nearby station. Um, ultimately, we weren't able to capture that in our model because we were making a model that was predictive. And so, you know, if we're having an app where someone is placing new stations, um, unfortunately, we don't have the resources right now to, you know, run a quick calculation and see what the density of that is and factor that into the model. Um, we believe that if we did, we'd probably get a more accurate model. So. That is, you know, a lesson learned for the future, um, but, you know, not at this time. When it comes to Mount Airy, when we looked at Mount Airy, there was variation, but there wasn't a whole lot. You know, it was much lower than elsewhere, and that, again, we thought was related to that network effect that we weren't able to capture or to model for, given that we also wanted to make an app that was reactive and interactive. Thank you. Um, we, we do. Do we have another uh, here? All right, Zoom, from Zoom, from Ian Smith, could you talk a bit more about the features in the model that have had the most predictive power in station performance? Were there features you thought would be predictive that were not? Uh, yes, so um, thank you, Aiden, for moving us through these slides. Um, again, owing to that network effect, uh, we saw that the number of stations and the number of weeks active that those stations have been was very, very helpful to our model, um, like decreased our error by like 30% when we included that in. Um, we were really surprised that um, 
The demographics of the proportion of residents within a grid cell that walk to work, that was um, highly correlated with ridership in our correlation plots, but ultimately wasn't very helpful to our model. Um, that was um, very surprising to us. It turned out population density was the best demographic um, indicator that we could include. Um, so that, those were some of the surprises that we had along the way. Thank you very much. Good job. Um, Chesapeake Bay Group. What, one of the big firsts from the bike share group this year is that they were the first Musa practicum uh, team to ever take a field trip, which I'm very jealous that I missed. They got to go to the bicycle transit systems facility and see them work on all the bikes, build the stations and stuff. What's that? You should, it looks so cool. I mean, it's enough to, it's like planner. It looked like planner heaven just to go look at that. So thank you for that invitation. Fire team, you took a field trip? You went to, I just thought you talked to them on the phone. I take it back. We have a tie. We have a tie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our presentation on the Chesapeake Bay land cover precision prediction. My name is Shu Jing, and I'm joined by my um, teammate, uh, Yuan and Singu. And before we start, we'd like to express our sincere thanks to our client, the Hampton Road Planning District Commission, for giving us this opportunity to work on this important project. A little bit background about this project. The location is in, located at the Chesapeake Bay area, which is a um, cross area of the three states and ha is have wider resource, both ecologically and economically. And we, we're here focused on specifically three county as our prototype, the James City as our sub suburb prototype, Isle of Wight as our rural prototype, and Portsmouth, the, biggest, the smallest area with the biggest population as our urban prototype. So our clients have recently proposed a green infrastructure plan that have to build a resilience community and provide a lot of benefits, including habitat protection, drinking water supply protection, storm water management, and create more recreation opportunities for the area. A new part of this um, plan is basically to build a model and ident identify the urban growth to evaluate pre present and future risks for development. Our project is focused on this specific part and help to improve the green infrastructure plan. The state, uh, the uh, question we've tried to address here is the precision prediction of land cover change from previous to imperial surface for prices the land for protection. The data set we use is provided by the conservancy uh, Charles Bay Conservancy, and the data is really precise. It's a one meter resolution land cover, which is providing 900 times more detail than the uh, usually available 30 meters resolution data provided by the national land cover. And the land cover type is being classified by us to two types, water, emergent wetland, tree canopy, shop, and low vegetation is being classified to perverse surface, and the rest is imperverse. That's um, even though water and wetland a lot of cases are considered imperverse uh, hydrologically, we here we consider to be per, um, perverse because the dynamic nature of the coastline here. So besides the land cover data, we also collect the M data from USGS and soil data from web soil survey and census data. All this data together is being processed and reclassified into the 10 meter by 10 meter raster. We choose this unit because they are a good, um, provide good enough precision for the um, planning detail and also avoid the noise of the one meter data. So our data exploratory, we find that land cover type is, is that, uh, the existing land cover type is directly related to the land cover change. For example, here in most county, we find that low vegetation change the most from uh, and James City and Iowa. It's a tree canopy that change the most. 
Besides the existing land cover, we also find some other biophysical factors matters a lot, like slope, soil, and terrain. Specifically here, the zero means on one means those surface change from perverse to imperverse, and there, zero means those don't change or change the opposite way. So for example, slope here, we can find those area change from perverse to perverse, imperverse have much more steep slope. And besides those side characters, we also find the census data change also matters a lot to our land cover change from 2014 to 2018. Here we can see the percentage of white shows really different distribution pattern at the change area from this, the whole county. Besides all these factors, we also find that land cover change really have, shows a spatial effect. All these land cover changes happen in certain clusters. Uh, we, ran, we ran the land cover prediction model based on the hypothesis obtained by our exploratory data analysts. So we think the probability of land cover change is a function of social economical factors, environmental factors, uh, spatial lag factors, and approximately uh, to existing land cover types. Uh, when we mining our data site, we saw there are several factors like canopy, road, and water uh, that are especially related to land cover change. However, instead of simply using the original land cover, we understand the chain is more likely to be triggered by the proximity to the land cover feature. Thus, we design a function and calculate for specific parameters and times for evaluating the feature's spatial influence. So when we go to the modeling part, the biggest challenge for modeling is that we need to handle a high resolution image data set and analyze based on every 10 by 10 meter cells. Thus, uh, in order to perform a scalable calculation, we then support the data set to, uh, to 100,000 and, um, and then fit it back to the whole data set. And we also do gel cross validation on block groups and evaluate the performance based on the confusion matrix. And the second challenge of the modeling part is that it's a really unbalanced data set, which means we have more zeros than ones. So to solve that, we first filter the data set to only use original previous land cover data. And then we balance the data set to uh, one to zero equal to one to 10. To make our model more stable, we trained our model for multiple times and avoid random results. And we also set the proper threshold to balance the model ability to predict both one and zero for our use case. Remember here we have three totally different counties and we really need to handle uh, over 10 million records. So to select the best model that perform under different county contexts, we experiment with three different model types, random forest, XGBoost, and GOM. And we select random forest for further prediction. We also use unseen new data to validate our result. And for most regions, the errors are below 0.3, which means the model performed quite well on the new data. We can also gain some insight from the models by plotting and comparing the feature importance. So obviously you can see the spatial lag features are of the top significance across three counties, but we can also see features like terrain, so type, and engineer features like water canopy are constantly important, indicating the environmental feature contribute more to land cover change, and they also prove the efficiency of our feature engineering approach. And here is a look of our predicted result for 2021. And we can see uh, for different counties, they have different proportion of land cover change due to they are in different developing stage. And by comparing the predicted and observed result, model ca can capture, actually capture some cluster characteristics around the uh, land cover change. 
and um, to better understand our same for the precision forecast, we select a sample square with a area of one kilometer by one kilometer in Port Morse. And by comparing the result in such a detailed scale, we can tell that the error in the prediction are likely to be around the true value, indicating the uh, effectiveness of the model. And when we look at the future prediction of 2021, we can see that many of the predicted change are consistent with the observed change. However, the model is also identifying some new area of land cover change. And this suggests that uh, it's able to detect new change that are not previously observed and can be very valuable for land management and the conservation efforts. Now I will talk about the use case of our project. Like we said earlier, like our project uses the random forest machine learning algorithms to analyze the high resolution data set and predict for future land cover changes. And with our app, our user can obtain the high quality predictions in a matter of seconds, making our app a very pre uh, effective and also efficient tool for analyzing the land cover change. So the use case is like uh, when the user of our app, like somebody named Andrew, uh, wants to make decision about uh, whether or not to invest more in uh, to protect some areas green infrastructure, uh, with our app, he can make more easily uh, like informed decisions. Uh, the process is like first they collaborate collaborate with their data center and they. Uh, provide the high resolution data set to us and we utilize this data to extract the features and to train our machine learning models by counties. And then we pick up a model with the best accuracy by comparing the results across different counties. And then we input the latest features to our model and then to make predictions for future land cover changes. And the next step is like, uh, we put our prediction into a web app that, that Andrew and his team could check to see the likelihood of land cover changes and also the original characteristics of that area. And by like balancing the need of growth and the need of protection, they can make decision about whether or not to invest more money in protecting the green infrastructure. And now I will show you some how to use our app specifically. Like imagine that you are all Andrew, and now I will teach you how to use our app. <laughs> okay. Uh, first, when you there's some something show problem. Uh, first, when you open our app, there you can read about the basic information about our project, what we did on this web page, and then you can check out the basic information about this region, about our study region, the three counties, and also the basic information, some context about this unique data set. And you can also find our contact information here. And when you go back to the top of this page, you can select a county that you want to explore more about land cover changes. Oh, thanks. Okay, so I will take Portsmouth as an example. When you open this page, you will find out that the map shows up. And on the left side of this map, there's a bar containing the information of this county. And then you can some check some features here by clicking on the buttons. When you click on the risk of change button, and you can find out the, uh, the likelihood of change of this areas generally. And when you zoom in, Okay, you see that this area maybe has high probability to change. And next step is to, now you can close this layer and click on another layer. Here, you can check more detailed information about this area. Okay. When you click on a cell, you can see the pop-up bar containing the basic information like the original land cover type, like this area used to be water, has a probability of 6% to change to impervious in the future. And I also label those areas with the highest risk of change to red so that the planners can see directly on map that this area needs special attention. Oh my gosh. Okay, now we can close this layer and open another layer. Uh, here you can check out the original land cover type of this whole county. Like you see in this region, there there should be a lot of 
areas are predicted to be changed. But you see that this area has already has enough uh, structures, so, so there's no need for building new structures. So the cells that uh, in this in this regions that are predicted to change should be protected. And you can also close this layer and open the census feature. You can also explore other census features here. And you see in this area, the total unit is zero. And but if there, this track has a need for development, so maybe the planners will just like this cells that predicted to be changed, just change naturally to previous. So in conclusion, we uh, we think we did a relatively good job at design and set up a workflow for testing and model process. And pr the predicting result in the end is not, uh, about 98%. However, the model, uh, the script, it takes a really long term to, ru uh, to run and might be uh, some hard time for re uh, reduplicate the process. And also, some of the we have some low lower accuracy on the um, predicting change that's due to the uneven data set. For the next step, we would look, like to explore different unit um, size for modeling. And also, when the 2022 data sets come out, we would definitely want to test and validate on that um, new data set. And that includes our presentation. Thank you. That, wow, I, I think with all these projects like this one, there's some extremely, extremely challenging data, data processing and uh, methodological issues that you don't see in the uh, presentation. But this one, there were some really uh, big hills to climb that were conquered. So it's a very impressive project. Do we have any questions? I thought that John Landis might have a question about this land use change modeling. Hi. It was a, um, a, a really great job um, on uh, on two fronts. Uh, I just want to compliment you. The first is, uh, I mean, the amount of data that you're processing, as Michael suggested, is just phenomenal. And the fact that you're even able to get a hand, handle on it, let alone reproduce it in real time, is really terrific. Um, the second thing is, um, I've only personally spent a little time in this area, and I don't know if you have any of the three of you have spent time personally down there. It doesn't sound like you took a field trip, but it's always difficult to, to do this sort of work in an area sort of using remote sensing data without actually going there. And, and I thought under those circumstances, you you did a really nice job of understanding it um, and getting to the issues. The, the, the question I have is ha, has to do with the use case um, and, and has to do with the, the way you conceptualize outcomes. Um, because I think in the case of pervious versus non-pervious land cover transition, the issue isn't just whether a particular grid cell transitioned or is likely to transition, um, it's whether um, the adjacent cells, particularly the uphill or the downhill cells are also likely to transition uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, storing up rain and precipitation and flooding and things like that. So I, my question was, do you have any thoughts about how you can bring that into the modeling framework that not only is an individual grid cell likely tra to transition, but it's adjacent either uphill or downhill or connected to another grid cell that's uh, likely to transition. Because I think the outcome associated with a network of transitions is very different than the outcome associated with individual transitions. Um, the fact that, I, that I'm even asking this question, which is if you're a flood modeler is the key question, um, is just testimony to how far you were able to push the science and technology here. Yeah, so uh, we actually did consider a little bit of this um, prospect on our feature engineer process. Uh, basically, we did a focal statistic um, based on different kind of um, land cover type. So that did in, um, kind of, besides the cell itself, did expand the way to think about the uh, cells that close to the specific type, like, oh, the, the, the next one, the next one, I think. Yeah, and also for the outcome, since uh, even though we are doing a binary classification, but actually we have the outcome as a probability of change. So we do, uh, we do a threshold for different um, class 
And you can see actually by setting different threshold, it can get some cells get connected. So uh, we test that um, when we are setting threshold to see uh, whether they are cluster or they are a single cell. So we do a lot of threshold setting so that I think this uh, can help. And also like we have a cluster, uh, a category uh, as the outcome. So they are also like, uh, a raster map for the probability on the web map. So you can check that as well. So yeah. Maybe we'll take the, maybe we'll put that, that those information into our use case map maybe later. And thank you for your suggestions about doing that. Other questions? So can I ask a question about your data itself? It seems that you are using a resolution of 10 meters grid for your predictions. And actually you have your land cover data with a resolution for one meter. So how you define the 10 meters grid? Uh, what is it represented the majority of the grid inside of it or something you define the prediction cells? Yeah, uh, for the original land cover type, since uh, they have uh, actually have uh, some road and also have some uh, infrastructure like buildings and that these things. If we recross those uh, to a very large grid cells, it will lose this type of feature. So, um, but also we need to come like consider our capability of uh, calculation and also our uh, future use for the prediction. So in order to like um, maintain the uh, feature of like rules, like this kind of granular uh, land cover type, and also uh, in order to like to base uh, do a model that can be calculated. So we um, choose ten meters as the finally like reclass uh, grid cells for our predictions. I have a question. Um, can you talk a little bit about the original data set? because it covers the entirety of the Chesapeake Bay and how you were thinking about how this generalizes to that whole area and what the the usefulness is of this data set in relation to how it's collected and served. Yeah, so basically um, we're thinking about this data set. We're now like basically predict in a county level and for the other county that hasn't including this three prototype, we can definitely continue use the same kind of message to predict for them. At the same time, as we said mentioned in the conclusion, we also like to test for different kind of unit instead of county level. Maybe next step we can actually zoom in to other levels and predict in a different kind of uh, unit. Do we have any questions from the Zoom room? We have a comment. Would you care to? Uh, a comment in Zoom from the, from the customer side, KC Filipino. Thanks for presenting. Those three locations are very unique. So I suspect the challenges were big. We can always add additional context to why you may or may not see change to help build on these models. We at HRPDC would be happy to check out the app in more detail. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great job. Okay, our next group is another Otis group presenting a project related to, to buses. Um, I should mention that all of these projects, there's a an open source code companion in addition to apps, which we publish on our website, uh, the Mesa Practicum website. So the idea is that um, other governments that use the same data sources uh, or have the same challenges can uh, try to replicate things that they might find of interest and that the clients can operationalize some of these things that they so so choose. So um, hopefully people across the Chesapeake region take up that last project.
Um, we've been working throughout the semester with um, SEPTA and Otis, um, specifically Andrew and Steve, um, to analyze and predict the um, patterns of bus bunching in Philadelphia. We'd also like to call that swiftly for the data that we used in our analysis. Um, so an agenda for today, we'll first give an introduction to the problem of bus bunching and why it matters. Um, then we'll talk about our specific use case, some key findings from our exploratory analysis. Um, then we'll talk about our approach to modeling future instances of bunching. We'll then give you a demo of our app and finally conclude with um, an evaluation of how the app performs in a real life situation. So if you were to ride the bus somewhere in Philadelphia, the ideal experience would be the one shown in this video. Buses would arrive at bus stops at regular intervals. If you missed a bus, you would know exactly when the next one is arriving. There would be sufficient space on the bus for passengers because buses would be arriving frequently and you would be able to plan your commute without much stress. But a lot of the times, uh, buses don't actually exhibit this behavior and instead they experience bunching. So as shown in this video, one bus, for whatever reason, um, will get delayed at some point, either at a bus stop or, or while moving. The bus behind it continues to travel at the original speed, eventually catching up to the de delayed bus in front of it. In this case, there is a long gap between buses, irregular arrival times, and discomfort to passengers who might be crowded onto buses. So bus bunching is a critical issue that needs to be tackled for several reasons. From the perspective of a resident using buses to get somewhere, bunching leads to unpredictability, longer wait times, and disruptions to their commute. Overall, this leads to a worse rider experience and it eventually leads to a lack of trust in the transit agency. At this point, the negative impacts of bus bunching extend beyond just the individual and begin to impact the city as a whole. People start to choose alternative modes of travel, such as cars, which then causes congestion and other negative in environmental impacts. So in thinking about these very real and unfavorable impacts on residents as well as on the city as a whole, we've identified our use case, and that is to provide reliable and frequent transit service to residents during their commute by predicting and responding to bus bunching along key bus corridors. We've thought about interventions um, to, this to this problem in two broad ways. The first one is more long-term and would include identifying where changes can be made to infrastructure, such as redesigning streets and improving bus stops and bus lanes. The second intervention is more operational and would include actually preempting bunching in real time and then changing the speed of buses accordingly or notifying passengers. Um, our app will focus on this second, more operational type of intervention. So before we go into our data analysis, I wanted to quickly define some terms that we'll be referring to throughout this presentation. So headway is the interval of time between two successive buses that are moving in the same direction and on the same route. Building off of that, a technical definition for bunching um, that we've used in our modeling is when the observed headway is half or less than the, than the expected headway. So coming to our data set, our analysis was based on a core data set from Swiftly. This data set contained information about 13 bus routes um, listed here for the month of October. The specific columns describe properties for each of these routes, um, such as the route ID, the trip ID, departure stop, arrival stop, um, the distance traveled, et cetera. Um, the operational variables related to the scheduled runtime and observed runtime became the foundation for all our analysis and predictive models. Um, so I'll try to illustrate some key findings with um, some vi visualizations. Um, here we have data for, the, for Route 21 from 5 to 6 p.m. over a two-week period in October. Um, so on the right, you can see that each um, row corresponds to a day of the week during this two-week period, um, and each column corresponds to a single bus stop on that bus route. Um, the color of the tiles indicates how much bunching is happening at that particular bus stop. Um, so Penn's Landing on the right is where the bus begins and it ends at on 69th Street. Um, so as you can see, when the bus moves from east to west, uh, bunching starts to begin around 22nd Street and this only um, persists and gets worse as you move westward. So from this, we gather that bunching is, some, is related to some function of 
accumulation, meaning the persistence of bunching, uh, the day of the week, um, the location of the bus stop, and the direction that the bus is moving in. Um, so building off of this, we have another visualization of bus bunching. Again, this is for Route 21 from 5 to 6 p.m. over a two-week period. Um, on the x-axis, we have the time of day, and on the y-axis, we have distance from the terminal. Each line represents a single bus traveling in the same direction, um, and the color of each point along that line indicates how much bunching is happening at that point. Um, so in the lower section of this graph, um, closer to the terminal, we see that the horizontal distance between each bus is relatively uniform and consistent, meaning that there isn't much bunching or gapping happening. Um, but as you move towards the upper section, you see that this distance, this horizontal distance um, is quite inconsistent, and this indicates that there is some bunching and um, gapping happening. Um, additionally, the slope of each of these lines indicates the speed at which each bus is traveling. So in the lower section, um, the slope is again uniform, meaning that the buses are traveling at similar speeds. But in the upper section, um, the slope becomes more flat, indicating that the buses are slowing down, um, meaning more bunching is happening. Um, this is another visualization of the same route, um, but moving westward. Um, this is also during the morning peak hour, whereas the graph on the left is during the evening peak hour. Um, and from this, we've gathered that bunching um, is some function of accumulation of bunching, the day of the week, um, the location of the bus stop, the direction the bus is moving in, as well as the hour of the day. So after extracting these patterns from our data set, we also considered some other predictors that could be associated to bunching. Relating to the transit system, we looked at the presence of signals at intersections and how many passengers are getting on at each bus stop. Um, we looked at uh, variables relating to geography, um, for example, the density of jobs and residents in a specific area. We also looked at weather and trash days. And then lastly, and most importantly, we looked at the operational variables relating to speed and headway of the bus, of the current bus, as well as the previous bus. So we tested these variables for um, associations to bunching. And as expected, we found that the current headway of the bus is the most significant. And this makes sense because of the way we've defined bunching. Um, we also found that the number of riders that get on at each bus at a given bus stop um, is associated to bunching. Um, this makes sense because the higher the number of riders that get on at each stop, the longer the bus has to wait there, um, potentially experiencing delays and leading to bunching. Then we have the stop sequence of a given bus stop. As we showed in the earlier graphs, um, once bunching starts, it begins to persist throughout the route. And so how far away a bus stop is from the terminal um, is also strongly associated to bunching. And lastly, we um, found that the hour of the bus operation um, is associated to bunching. So our initial approach to modeling was to predict where and when all instances of bunching occurs at a stop level. However, we found that because bunching persists, our data set contains way more instances of bunching than non-bunching. Um, and this would lead to a model that is inherently accurate, but not necessarily very useful. So to tackle this, we decided to model the initiation of bunching, which is basically uh, predicting a bus that is currently not experiencing bunching um, when it will begin to bunch. Um, so to do this, we subsetted our training data to include only the instances of non-bunching and the instances where bunching starts to begin. Um, this approach lends itself to a more useful model because it identifies where exactly interventions need to be targeted. So given that our use case is to provide reliable and transit, um, reliable and frequent transit service to residents, um, this is how we envision our model and app working itself into an operational workflow. Um, so someone at SEPTA would uh, input the route and direction for a specific bus into the app, and the app would output whether that bus, whether and where bunching will happen on that bus route within the, up to the next 20 stops. Um, based on this output, um, the speed of the bus can be adjusted accordingly. 
Uh, now I'm very happy to do a short demo of the app. Um, let me do the last. I'll go back there. Okay. I'll, I'll talk from the back because this needs a lot of operation. <laughs> okay, here you can see um, this is the landing page of the app. And um, so, so here is a map showing where all the buses are. If I click on real time and start observing, um, we're just observing where the buses are. I can, here you can see actually here and now, these are the buses, these are the 21 buses running at this very moment. Um, yeah, and here, here we already have bunching. And to predict to see where bunching is happening, if I click on, you can select a bus route, and then you can also select which direction you wanna do. And then you can click on, you can select a trip from this panel, or you can um, do it from here. And then in, it takes some time, so under the hood, under the hood, um, we I have been observing and caching real time data from a transit API for like uh, this whole afternoon, and then when I when I have selected a particular trip under the hood, the data is passed on to a, a Google Cloud platform where a particular model is running, and then after certain seconds. Um, a prediction result will come back. For example, although this trip, for example, is this bus is currently very far away from the, the bus in front of it, the model shows that like it has a um, it is predicted to have a likelihood to bunch after 15 stops. So it is possible for a certain dispatch center to kind of communicate with the bus driver to kind of slightly fine tune the speed of the bus. And because of this, because the speed of the buses have been adjusted, new real-time predictions will come up, will come back and update the predictions, um, so that hopefully this will lead to a smoother ride and um, avoid bunching, whereas without causing more problems than um, it solves. So here is a demo of the app, and currently, right now, we are only having uh, three routes, and it. it it, but um, as a proof of concept, in the future, we um, we 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 may be able to kind of observe um, real time bus locations constantly and predict for more routes. Yeah, and I'll hand over to Mia again. Um, so to really evaluate the effectiveness of our app in delivering reliable and frequent transit service to residents. We considered what was at stake in different situations, and we created a very high level cost benefit analysis that is based on the dollar value of someone's time. So we made a couple of assumptions, and I won't go into too much detail about the calculations, but to summarize, if we accurately, accurately predict bunching when it does happen, we will save $4 per rider. And if we don't predict bunching when it does happen, we will place a cost of $4 on each rider. So we want to maximize this first scenario and minimize the second. In doing this, we achieved an accuracy rate of 85%, which translates to around $16,000 saved per rider for one week in October. We also tested um, the model and the app on other routes that were not trained in the model. Um, and we found that we achieved an accuracy rate of 77%. Um, and this translated to a savings of around $12,500 per rider during one week in October. And so to conclude, we really think that this app is a useful first step in tackling the problem of bus bunching. Thank you. Uh, while we're waiting for questions from the clients to come in. Do we have questions from the audience? Yes, uh, Eugene. Uh, 
Uh, this was uh, really interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, I just have, I guess, one question and comment maybe. Could you talk a little bit about how this app, how this product compares to what Swiftly is offering in their work? Because I know that you're using Swiftly's data and some of the stuff that they do does address bunching. So is it that you are presenting a, a new model, a predictive model? Is it that you also have a consumer facing app? So just hearing a little bit about, you know, how this differs from what Swiftly is doing would be fascinating. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. I think uh, for the Swiftly data, it's collected. Um, so the, the data that we got is already being collected. So it's not predicting real time, um, but our app actually uh, is predicting bunching real time. So the operator of SEPTA could intervene right away if they see that, oh, there's gonna be bunching 15 stops ahead, for example, then they can somehow tune the speed of bus right now in order, for, in order to prevent that bunching to happen. Yeah, um, thanks guys for presenting. Uh, it was really informative. Um, I'm just wondering um, in the specific, I guess, makeup of the data sets, I'm wondering um, if the specificity of the route itself uh, means that it would be make more sense, I think, to maybe uh, do the training and testing model per route instead of having everything on the combined data set. I know you guys have talked about that in the past, so. Yes, um, so we have different approaches. So actually in the app that I, I showed you, the model that have been used by the app is actually trained by route. And um, for the project markdown purpose, we want to just generally kind of, it's a whole process thing. Um, so to kind of understand the problem, we kind of train the model on multiple routes and, and also to test the generalizability of the model, we kind of Test uh, train the model on some routes and test it on other routes, and for the and, and also that that uh, model is also uh, used for like exp explanatory purposes to help us understand the problem. For the app, on the other hand, we want to maximize uh, the accuracy. So for the app, it's the model is trained for each route on a route basis. So right now we have like three three sets of models on three routes. And also we have different models trained for predicting different distances into the future. For example, we have a model to predict 11 stops into the ahead into the future, and we will have a different model to predict 20 stops into the future. So um, on the cloud, we now have like 30 models to run if you, um, to predict different results. Thank you. Yeah, this was a very interesting presentation, and I think it really shows that one of the great sort of side benefits of, of, of this sort of modeling is how much you learn about the underlying phenomena that you didn't know before. And I can see you folks are now the sort of world's experts on bunching in, in, in SEPTA buses. Um, this reminds me that this is a little, bunching is a little like whack-a-mole, just when you think you've solved it, another bunch comes up. I remember dealing with this problem back in 1976 uh, with queuing theory in Boston, and it's still with us. Um, I wanted to ask a sort of a policy question here based on your findings, which I thought were really interesting. I want to highlight two findings. The first was when you tried to run your model, you found that um, the bunching was the most common experience. and The non-bunching was the less common. And I thought that was very interesting. Um, and it was a way of thinking about it that I hadn't thought about before. Um, and the second thing was in your sort of cost benefit analysis, you came up with a rather large finding that if we could eliminate bunching or reduce it, we'd save people $4. I don't know if that was a ride or per passenger, but that's a, a lot. Um, so I wonder, here's the policy question. Oh, I just wanted to say, I thought those, um, the, the early diagrams early on that you talked about that showed the sort of the geography of bunching as you went along, that was just terrific. And I don't know if SEPTA has that, but uh, you should sell it to them because they could really use it. Um, but I, the policy question is, um, given the importance of um, the number of passengers uh, boarding and deboarding in determining bunching, do you think uh, SEPTA ought to look for a different style of uh, uh, bus egress or egg, uh, getting on or getting off? And particularly, many countries have found that um, sort of bus rapid transit style boarding systems where you prepay for your trip 
And then you have multiple doors on one side that enable everybody to get on and off very quickly uh, really reduces um, uh, uh, idling times or station times at the stations and really reduces bunching. And I wonder, based on your analysis, whether you would suggest sort of thinking about that uh, different ways, different technologies, different approaches to getting on and off the bus as a way of uh, reducing bunching, particularly given your high cost estimates that you came up with. Yeah, I think, um, like we said, the this is only a false step in tackling bus bunching. And I think, like we mentioned earlier, um, this would work well if it was if it went hand in hand with the longer term inventions interventions. So including um, interventions like bus rapid transit or um, infrastructure changes to bus lanes and um, bus stops. So I think, like you said, it would have to work um, hand in hand with longer term interventions. Um, but this is only a small solution to that problem. Yeah, and then as to my knowledge, I think SEPTAS has already been thinking about those things. So with the troll modernization and the bus revolution, I think they're adopting a lot of um, interventions such as um, having um, multiple doors uh, for boarding, um, for, for trolleys especially. So yeah, I think that's um, that's feasible in the future. And um, from our reading and reference, I think the policy solution was because in, in operational sense, we can see that in particular, once one bus would slow down and because one, one particular bus is, as, is slowing down, bunching tends to persist and aggravate further in part because like because a bus is late and slow down, like more passengers will accumulate at the next stop and with, with no like motor door boarding and stuff, the boarding time will um will be worse because passengers are accumulating, and this is a factor um to explain the fact that bunching always ag aggravates along the route and not uh, it doesn't it doesn't um ease off. So I would I would say that uh, I would definitely recommend um these policies um to kind of improve to improve boarding experiences given the budget uh given the available budget budgets. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I wanted to ask one. Can you unpack that cost benefit estimate a, l a little more and explain just in terms of like lines, units of time, what that, where that sure. comes from? Yeah, sure. Um, so I got this information from Federal Highway Administration in which they provide cost benefit analysis guidance um, and the, uh, the um, dollar for a rider per hour in traveling, the value of time of that is $17 per hour. So um, we kind of use that as our base and thinking about, so for example, um, ideally you would come to a bus stop anticipating a bus to come, right? So uh, you arrive at the scheduled time. However, because of gapping, the bus already passed. Um, because it was faster than usual and it caught up with the next bus. So you have left um, waiting for another bus for 15 minutes. Um, and we kind of uh, used that. So 15 uh, times the hourly value of um, the minute value, sorry, that we divide the hourly value by 60 to get the minute value. And uh, 15 times that minute value gives us um, $4. Yeah. Uh, thanks, guys. That was great. I um, A couple of you mentioned that this app could help SEPTA uh, adjust their bus speed. I'm having a hard time envisioning uh, what that might look like. If, there, if you guys predict there will be bus bunching ahead, do you tell the second bus to slow down? Uh, what that what what would that mean to the general to the traffic operations in general? And you know, would the passengers on the second bus be happy about that? And you know, um, if there is no bunching, do you tell the second bus to like floor it? You know. Yeah. Um, yes. The the thing. Yes, it's possible. Like I think um, in our early on readings, the practice in the industry has been like. There, there is solutions in terms of let it first letting the first bus go faster if possible, or even skip a couple of stops if there are no passengers 
waiting there and also at the same time telling the second bus to slow down in a little bit. I know like this won't necessarily make the passengers inside of the second bus happy, but in terms of like evening, but in like evening out the the buses that come spring out the buses that comes um that comes after the first delayed bus um like this bus is particularly slowed down in a bit but it won't be but the the situation where two buses comes together to every bus persists multiple stops um could be avoided and this will um provide a better experience for passengers for example because um they won't be or stuffed into a very crowded bus and at the same time uh, for passengers waiting at the bus the bus stops coming um before the bunch stations their their schedules will be more their frequency they they will be expecting more stable frequencies of the bus rather than okay two buses come this, the same time and then um, 20 minutes um, before the next bus comes. Like in, in a general sense, maybe by slowing down the second bus, um, maybe the overall capacity of buses could, I wouldn't say that it, it would be increased, but then people, the, the schedule stability would be increased. And then um, in a general sense, people trust the schedules of the buses more. And that's the, yeah, that's our understanding of the issue. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I, yeah, that was a comment. <laughs> that was a comment. Oh, that was a, that was a comment. Yeah. I have two more comments here from Andrew Simpson of SEPTA on the Zoom. First off, great work on this uh, very tricky problem. And Andrew apologizes he could not be here in person. Uh, but secondly, adding to some of the comments that were already done here, he will also add that we're looking at long term trends and association in these data to identify physical infrastructure interventions. While there may be daily operational changes that could be pursued, this will also help us make sure that we're investing in the right long-term infrastructure. Good job. Thank you very much. Good job. Um, okay, our next group is Community Legal Services. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Stephanie Onwaja, and I'll be walking us through our project, which is, which is a housing displacement information system. With this project, we hope to mitigate the systems and processes by which people are forced out of their homes via evictions in Philadelphia. So this is our team. Um, this is Chris, and Zula is on the back. Um, uh, they've been wonderful to work with. Um, as a team, we would like to thank our client, Community Legal Services, uh, for all of their help throughout the project, as well, um, particularly Lauren Parker, who has been in communication with us, helping us and answering all questions that we've had. We also want to thank Jonathan Powell from Legal uh, Philadelphia Legal Assistance and Steve Sufian from Who Owns Philly. And uh, without their help, this project would not have been possible. Um, so we're going to jump right in. Um, the number on the screen represents the number of evictions that have been filed in Philadelphia from 2016 to 2022. Um, you may have some knowledge about evictions, but just to re reiterate the importance of this project and the impact that it has on in individuals, um, not only does it um, take away um, housing um, and displaces people, but it can also have adverse impacts to their mental health and physical health. Uh, which has implications to their um, economic um, achievements and educational achievements as well. And it could potentially also have long-term impacts, such as the inability to secure housing in the future, as well as a damaged credit score. Uh, and it's very important to point out that evictions impact communities of color disproportionately, uh, low-income households as well, and people with disabilities due to discriminatory discriminatory practices in the housing markets. So let's go to the next. Oh, I'm going to pass on to Chris. 
Uh, thank you. Um, so I will talk about the story in Philadelphia, but before we um, start, I would like to say that all the characters that we're mentioning are fictional. Um, the property owner names are fictional, and they're not supposed to mimic anything in real life. All right, so this is Kate. Kate is a single mother of two, and she used to live in a neighborhood in University City. Her kids used to go to Harrington Elementary School, and she works as in an administrative position at the VA hospital. Kate lived in an affordable um, housing unit, so it had a subsidy on it that was scheduled to expire in June 2022. Um, so right a month, a month after that, in July, Kate was evicted because she was unable to um, attain legal, obtain legal assistance to prevent this eviction from happening. Um, and she was also unable to afford alternative housing options in the neighborhood. This is the predicament of quite a few um, single parents that live in neighborhoods like University City where the housing prices are continuously rising throughout the years. This next character is Andrew. Andrew is a fitness trainer and lives in the Port Richmond neighborhood in Philadelphia. Andrew's um, property owner has filed several evictions over the past year, and it is said that this property owner wants to renovate the apartment complex and lease it out to tenants who are able to pay higher rents. Andrew currently stands at a risk of eviction and requires legal assistance, and this is where we're hoping our client CLS comes in. Thank you, Chris. So CLS is an organization in Philadelphia that provides um, legal assistance and representation to low income residents in Philadelphia and their housing unit uh, particularly helps out with this uh, following services. So they help out with evictions in a case where there's a termination of the Section 8 program uh, and these other things that are listed above. Um, and currently their processes, if we can go to the next slide, please, um, uh, involve um, providing this services as needed, which means that when a person gives them a call or shows up at the office, they are able to provide those services, which limits their reach. If we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, I thought it was important, we thought it was important to talk about the legal eviction process in Philadelphia to kind of understand where intervention can take place. So eviction, the eviction process starts with an eviction notice, which is step one. So after that happens, that's when the owner notifies the tenant that they have to move out. Um, this is now when the legal process begins. Uh, this begins as step two, which is when the owner files an eviction complaint uh, and notifies the tenant of the hearing date, which is step three. During the hearing date, the tenant has to show up to court to defend the claims that were filed against them. If failure to show up um, ends up in a default judgment, uh, after the judgment is passed, um, the renter has 10 days to appeal, uh, which leads, leads us to step four, which is the actual eviction process. It actually takes a little bit longer than um, you would imagine, but it actually, um, after 10 days, after the uh, amount of time that you're able to appeal, the owner files for a writ of possession and they notify the renter which gives them 11 days um, where they have to move out during that process. So le this leads us to the points of intervention. So a more proactive point of intervention would be to intervene before an eviction notice is given to a tenant. A more reactive form of intervention would be after the legal process begins. Uh, and CLS hopes to um, do the intervention in the proactive phase. So you can go to the next slide. And this is where our model comes in. So with our model, we're hoping that to provide CLS, uh, uh, to allow CLS to kind of get ahead of the issue before it happens, provide um, legal services, as well as just outreach services that they um, currently are able to provide. So our app, Eviction Watch, would be predicting the eviction complaint file. And that's also what goes into our model uh, to predict future filings of uh, eviction. Uh, yeah, and this is our predicted outcome, and um, which leads us to our use case, which is um, if we're using our app, Community Legal Services will identify eviction frequency at a property level in order to proactively allocate legal resources to tenants at risk of facing eviction. 
Uh, and now we're going to do a demo of our app. And I'm going to pass the mic to Zula. So since the mouse is work, it's not work on the front. So I'm going to do the demo here. Uh, Here we go. So here is a very brief dashboard for our application. The name is Inviction Watch. So there are many two parts on the left side. You can see there are several panels. You can filter the data and do some searching based on that. On the right side, there is a map. So color by the different number of evictions filed historically. So when the darker the color means the higher number of evictions is. So we can do some basic training uh, basic tasks on this dashboard, such as we can search on a specific address like this, 3119 Barring Street. Here we go. So that is a little bit time consuming, but it will. Here we go. So at this property, we can see all the detailed information based on that property. We can see uh, the address and the, our predictions and the property information and the historical eviction records from 2016 to 2020 and by different seasons. And we can also zoom in and zoom out based on the property layers and the neighborhood layers. And there is also the historical records and our predictions shows by the map based on uh, based on the neighborhoods. And for our client to use, there are top three of our top ten of our predictions list uh, below here. When we click at that property, it will return the map here. And we say there is uh, the first, uh, the highest risk of eviction will happen at this place. And I uh, think uh, when our clients, uh, such as the staff from the community and legal services use it, you can zoom in and zoom out using this map to select the darkest place and find where the exact property is, or he can use our predictions by clicking the property and know what is going to happen here. So that's a brief demo. Let's come back to our presentation. Thank you, Zulu. Okay, so, um, right. So we're going to talk about exploring the data and in the next two minutes, condense what we've done for the past like five months. Um, our main data source is the one that Jonathan Pyle provided us with um, from Philadelphia Legal Assistance, and it is the Municipal Court Eviction Filings data set. It has information on eviction filings from 2016 to 2022, and this is the data set that gives us a dependent variable, which is the count of eviction filings in the city. Um, this data set also contains information on owner type, as well as um, how much the tenant pays for rent, how old the building was, et cetera. The other data sources really quickly is um, the data set of all properties in Philadelphia, which we obtained from the Office of Property Assessment. We also use the 2021 ACS estimates for demographic data at a block group level. We also use the LNI data set, as well as um, subsidized housing information from the NHPD data set. Next slide, right. So this is a visual from our core data set, which is the municipal filings. Um, this shows you the count of eviction filings by year. And you can see that from 2016 up until 2019, the count of eviction filings have always been about 20,000. But in 2020, after the pandemic, the CDC, um, in, the CDC had their eviction moratorium. Um, and you can see as an effect of that, the number of the count of eviction filings has significantly decreased. So it went all the way from 20,000 to like 7,000. It is important to note that the moratorium expired in 2021, which could be why there is an increase in eviction filings from 2021 to 2022. Um, so really quickly, key takeaways in the interest of time. Eviction filings have temporal characteristics, which means that it varies from varies between months every year. The highest filings tend to occur in August, September, and October, and the lowest filings occur in April. 
Um, this seems kind of obvious, but the properties that are owned by for-profit companies see uh, a larger rate of eviction filings compared to properties owned by public entities like the Philadelphia Housing Authority. Properties with housing subsidies also seem to experience lower rates of eviction filings. Um, I'm just going to really quickly talk through this. Um, so as you can see here, properties that are valued under 5 million and bit over 20 million also seem to have a larger rate of eviction filings. These um, properties that are valued over 20 million could be apartment complexes as well. We do have a detailed breakdown of this that is available in that markdown if anyone's interested. Um, okay, we can skip through this. Next slide, please. Please, next slide. <laughs> Okay, right. Uh, really quickly, pre-processing the data. So we joined all of these data sets to the municipal court filing. Um, we took important variables like number of violations, as well as race, demographics, income, um, whether the house had a subsidy or not. We joined it to um, the municipal court filing data set using different packages and um, spatial joints that we're very happy to talk about after this presentation. Just to reiterate, once again, this is a lot of information, but our dependent variable and what we're predicting is the count of eviction filings for each property in Philadelphia. And to do that, we have a range of independent variables that are at a property level as well as at a block group level. Right, um, modeling the data. Next slide, please. Um, the zero inflated Poisson model is the one that we're using here. And this is um, just quick brief of what this is. We have, as you can see here, this image shows us the number of zeros that our data set has. So for most properties in Philadelphia has not had an eviction, which means that our data set just has a lot of zeros. And what the zero inflated person model does is that it adjusts the data set and balances it to account for the large number of zeros in it. Um, just this visual on the right shows that so we have data from 2016 to 2022, and using data from 2016 to 2020 um, to predict the future seemed um, kind of a bad idea because of the COVID, um, the moratorium that was in place. So we decided to just take 2022 data and split, split I can't speak, split into test and training um, for our model. So Stephanie will talk to you about our model outcomes. Thank you, Chris. Um, so right here we have a graph of the uh, mean uh, absolute error, which kind of just means um, the differences between the observed and the predicted uh, outcomes of our model. And the lower the MAE, the better the model. So in this um, outcome, we, we tested several variables and several um, uh, variables that contain numeric, numeric variables, uh, categorical variables, accounted for uh, time. And we found that actually, um, after um, several iterations that the, the model that contained neighborhood effects performed the best, which actually in Philadelphia is very important because each neighborhood is so different, which and um, the eviction could also perform differently in each neighborhood. Um, oh, so I mean, oh yeah. So I will skip through the model outcomes because all of this is uh, detailed in our markdown, but we can go to the next slide. We wanted to kind of compare um, the model accuracy to general generalizability. And there are three patterns that we found in our model. So our model is really good at predicting in properties with very high frequency of eviction filings historically. It's also good at predicting in uh, in properties with no history of eviction filings, but it's not does not do as well at predicting at um, properties with a low uh, frequency of eviction filings. Um, and this is something that we hope to improve if we had more time. So here we just have three examples of those instances. Right here, the first instance is a property with a history of very high of frequency of eviction filings. You can see it, the predicted outcome is kind of close to the observed outcome. If you go to the next slide, um, right here is an instance where with a property with no eviction records in the, in the past, and the model is able to predict that accurately. And the next slide, um, here we show that the instance where our model doesn't do so well. So taking the nuances in a property that has a lower um, um, frequency of evictions in the past. Um, here, the, um, the observed value was three and we were not able to predict an outcome in this property. Uh, and the same here, but we can move to the next slide. Do you want 
Um, okay, so we understand that our model is not the best, but we intend this to be like a proof of concept that can be built upon and like variables can be added to it to make it better. We also want to like reiterate the fact that housing insecurity, homelessness and evictions are such a huge issue in the country as well as in Philadelphia. So we really hope that this is the first step towards making this mitigating this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions from room or from client? By the way, I would like to mention my former classmate from graduate school and the client for the class and a Penn studio lecturer, Lauren Parker. Hello, Lauren. Um, questions? Okay, I have a question. Um, given what you know about the approach of your client um what is the what is the value added of having this these sets of predictions and how can that be integrated into what else they know in a more qualitative way about w where evictions are likely to happen and how they can be helpful um i would say that um having a predictions of, of future eviction filings could kind of help First, one thing, first of all, help CLS um, get ahead of the issue. So either um, instead of mitigating an eviction filing, perhaps providing legal assistance for, um, uh, or um, kind of like negotiating um, a out better outcome with the owner, which would actually even prevent the eviction from taking place in the first place. And the second thing would be to widen their re reach because we're taking a more proactive approach, approach and not waiting for people to come to them. So they will be able to do an outreach and um, reach out to people at a property level and to see these are our services and this is how we can help you if you're facing these problems. To just follow up on that, uh, I think like we are also hoping that this would help um, reach a wider range of tenants with housing insecurity. So more than just evictions, maybe CLS could also like target people who need help finding places with if they have like a Section Eight voucher or just it's more it's just it's about widening their reach and like yes, I'm gonna trail off. Okay. <laughs> so this is in a question but it's more of just an observation which is uh, I guess two things one the effort it takes to join all these data sets is significant so I don't want that to be lost so great job with just tackling that and I think that piece will serve you in later projects um, and then two yeah to this question that Michael just asked um, we are starting to try to be more proactive about bigger apartment buildings that are seeing um, a rise in evictions. So I think particularly because your model did well for those particular cases, that could be, you know, could help with some of that sort of proactive intervention around bigger apartment buildings. Thank you. Yeah, great job, y'all. Um, so my question is uh, outside of previous eviction filings, um, what other factors would y'all would want to incorporate to increase your uh, model's predictability, accuracy, and where do you think you can find that data? Um, okay. I mean, I, I think, okay, actually, if you go to the previous slide, um, this, the some of the things that we think that might help would be further categorizing the property level data that we have because those um, data sets have more information on all the properties and all the ones that have zeros and ones. And then another thing that we think that would be very helpful is actually to uh, make the scope smaller. So instead of predicting for the whole of Philadelphia it would be to predict more regionally because um, there's so many nuances at uh, the localized level that could potentially improve the predictions as well. I, I have one one last question before we move on to our next group, which is, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about these data and where they come from. 
Um, so the municipal code data set was from Jonathan Pyle from Philadelphia Legal Assistance, who scraped out just a massive data set of municipal court filings, which is like a huge task um, that probably took a lot of time. We got the, well, the OPA data set and all of this stuff is available on the internet and op on Open Data Philly. But we got a lot of help from Stephen, who works for Who Owns Philadelphia, um, who helped us. This joining thing took months. Um, and we were stuck constantly, um, but Stephen helped us with joining data um, at an ad with like addresses using the pa Pashing parser, which is available for addresses in Philadelphia. It's a Python script that's incredible. Um, but yeah, so municipal court, Jonathan Pyle, Stephen Sufian, and then the rest of it's from just available online. Yeah, maybe I can add more information about the data set. So we are, our model is based on the all the per parcels, all the properties in Philadelphia is half a million of that data set. So it is a huge data set. Uh, so we basically train the data set based on the address, uh, the mailing address and the real location of that data set. Because when the mailing address is equal to the location, it means that the owner of that property really lives there. So it is not for a rent. So we train the data set based on that. So we got maybe uh, 20, 200,000 data sets for our final model to prediction. And here we got the result because uh, about more than 99% 99.9% .9 of our eviction count is zero. So our model is really doing a great job in predicting zeros, but also doing a great job predicting uh, the power, the evictions, which has a higher number, and but not for the only one or two evictions have ever happened at that place. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, fantastic job. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm really hopeful somebody's life is going to get changed by your project. Um, El Paso, our last group. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, we're presenting our practicum project, planning and forecasting bus transit alternatives in El Paso, Texas. Uh, before we begin, we would like to thank our client over at the El Paso Capital Improvements Department. Um, this includes Alex Hoffman, who is the manager of capital planning at El Paso, for all the support and enthusiasm throughout this process, as well as Adam Gorski, who's a data science at El Paso, for his assistance as well. And of course, our professors, Matt and Michael, through the practicum process and Jumbe through our cloud computing process. To introduce ourselves, my name is Jack Rumler, and I serve as the project manager of the team, and I'm joined by my teammates, Charlie Humler, who served as our R and modeling lead, and Ying Shu Oh, who, lead, who led our web app development. So to begin with our problem statement, the Sun Metro Transit System is the transportation provider in El Paso. Um, with declining ridership patterns and a network that could benefit from more interconnectivity, Sun Metro is looking to redesign bus routes whilst maximizing both the equity and fair revenue implications of route alternatives. This can be tricky, however, given that areas of disinvestment um, may contain transit dependent populations. Um, which also are the ones that can provide minimal profitability. We're looking to explore how new routes can maximize ridership while providing equitable access to transit for all Apasa residents. So Sun Metro Transit has experienced a similar problem that many transit agencies across the country have experienced, um, decreasing ridership annually with a major decrease in service, of service delivery at the beginning of the pandemic. Since March 2020, ridership has slowly increased annually. And in 2022, as you can see on the graph, um, ridership has reached about 70% of pre-pandemic levels. One of the several services Sun Metro has done to increase ridership is the introduction of bus rapid transit lines called Brio. Uh, the, there are four Brio routes in total, which are fixed routes with stops every three quarters to one mile. And these four routes account for nearly 40% of total uh, system ridership and connect riders to 28 of the 31 local bus routes. And to kind of sum up all the work El Paso is doing, uh, this quote that came from Trains, Buses, and People by Christoph Spieler says that El Paso, often forgotten, is building a stronger transit network than most US cities, highlighting all the amazing work that uh, the Sun Metro Transit System is already doing. 
So to get into our use case, um, with all this in mind, uh, we are aiming to develop a proof of concept framework for Sun Metro transit planners to understand the implications of new bus route scenarios on revenue and equity. We are measuring revenue as optimizing ridership of a route and equity as the ability for all residents to have fair and reliable access to transit. We break, the, we break down the outcomes of this into two parts. Part one will be to develop a latent bus transit demand model based on 2022 bus ridership to understand the demand for bus transit services. Uh, we engineer a variety of features into this model that are predictive of ridership and equity, such as demographic data, employment data, and amenity accessibility. And then we transfer this into this model into an informational evaluative app where a user can upload a new bus route and it'll be able to show the predicted annual ridership on top of our chosen equity indicators for a transit planner to understand how the route performs in the greater network. Cool. Thank you, Jack. So yeah, to begin with our data exploration, we looked at the geographical structure of El Paso. Uh, our group can agree we gained a great appreciation for the city uh, with everything that goes into it, uh, despite not getting a field trip, unfortunately. Uh, so we see the county is in the westernmost end of the state of Texas. And the city makes up a proportion of the county, but contains nearly 80% of the population. The city limits are quite discongruent, which is contextualized by the large military presence in the city, specifically the Fort Bliss military base, which takes up a large portion of the county. Another major, major geographical feature of the city is the Franklin Mountain State Park, which is one of the largest state parks contained entirely in an urbanized area of the U.S. city's limits. It takes up a huge sliver to the northern part of the city. The Rio Grande River also serves as a geographic boundary to the south and a political boundary between the U.S. and Mexico, specifically Ciudad Juarez, south of El Paso. And finally, with the current bus network overlain, we see how the Sun Metro system has done a successful job working in its unique positionality for reaching a relatively large portion of the city limits. So here we zoom in on the downtown portion of El Paso. And yeah, in our understanding of the city, we're taken aback with uh, the central place of this downtown being the confluence of each of these quadrants of the city leading into the center area. Uh, we'll notice the main transit center here where three of the Brio routes come, as well as a uh, fun fact in San Yancito Plaza until the seventies, there were live alligators and eventually the city figured it was too dangerous. So they replaced the live alligators with this beautiful alligator statue, uh, as well as the El Paso Chinchillas Stadium, a minor league baseball stadium right here with these wonderful jerseys. We had to give that a shout out. Uh, a large proportion of the city's jobs are located within the section of the map. Uh, and also you'll notice these hexagons, but we'll get into that later in our presentation. All right. Uh, so the data that we received from our client was uh, ridership data for the year 2020. Oh. Uh, the data we received from our client was the ridership data for the year 2022, uh, which is collected using sensors installed on buses, recording the number of people onboarding and offboarding at each stop. Uh, about 85% of the buses had sensors at any given time, so there's some potential bias in the data, but this does give a pretty high level overview of ridership patterns in the city. And then looking at the ridership for the year 2022 at large, we see that the Brio routes dominate the majority of transit ridership. They're the top three most populous routes. Um, but you can see the fourth Brio route kind of falls in the middle here. And this route was introduced in October 2022. So, um, you know, for two months of ridership, it does su surpass like several of the other types of routes. And then you can see local bus routes are in this blue color. There's 31 um, local routes out of 56 total routes. Um, for our modeling purposes, we only use local route ridership, um, as local routes are the ones with the most political malleability, as they're unfixed, and uh, we are kind of have the uh, leverage to change them. And then revisiting our context map bef from before, the local bus routes are overlain in red. And essentially, kind of the point we're making here is with local routes being the predominant type of route, being 31 of the 56 routes, and makes up the majority of existing route infrastructure, yet only 40% of the ridership presents opportunity to encourage um, increased ridership on local bus routes. Oh, okay.
All right, so this is a uh, quintile breakdown of ridership at the route and stop level. Um, so you can see a high clustering of um, high ridership in the downtown area, which makes sense with a density of population in addition to amenities. And then if you zoom out of the, uh, the map again, you can see that there's high ridership along some pretty essential corridors, um, particularly like this one is the Mesa corridor, which has a Brio route in addition to the Montana corridor over here, which also has a Brio route. And then um, if you zoom out of the map a little bit to get like a high level image of ridership patterns, um, you can see like these white dots, um, the further you sprawl out into the city, uh, less likely you are to see high ridership. And one area of um, particular interest for us was this kind of like low ridership along uh, the Southeast, um, along the I-10 corridor. So um, just to point out some of the unique features of the spatial distribution of ridership. All right, so now we begin with our feature engineering process, which um, this begins by taking the total local route ridership and aggregating it into a hexpin map of El Paso. Um, essentially, hexpins create a uniform spatial structure across our study region, um, permitting a granular analysis of ridership patterns. So that way, when our clients analyze the ridership and equity implications of new routes, they can identify areas being over or underserved by transit. Uh, we excluded the downtown hex, as you can see, this one right here. Um, given that that's where all the Brio routes um, connect to, and it just created a really um, large outlier in our, our data. And we also excluded um, those kind of random dots that you see missing um, are ones that have uh, transfer bays in them, which also have really, really high ridership, just kind of creates uh, our transit planners kind of know that um, you should uh, link uh, local bus routes to these transfer bays. And each hex bin is approximately 0.1 square miles, and we kind of arrived to that from just experimenting with our model. So to get into our feature um, selection process, our team utilized various data sources to derive features that we believed would accurately predict ridership based on demographic and built environment indicators. To ensure equitable distribution and service provision, regardless of socioeconomic status or other demographic characteristics, we gathered census data at the track level to analyze the spatial distribution of uh, demographic variables. We also utilize national walkability index data at the block group level and longitudinal employment household data to investigate the relationship between accessibility of destinations, households, jobs, and roadways to ridership, as well as the age, income, and um, sector distribution of job centers, enhancing the implications of equity and accessibility of serving diverse populations through transit. We obtained built environment amenity data from Open Data El Paso and OpenStreetMap and calculated nearest neighbor distances for various features, which helped explain the proximity of essential amenities and whether transit routes are providing optimized access. And finally, we geocoded additional spatial features like stop density per hex bin, which helps bolster ridership at a hex bin level. And of these features, those that are highlighted seem to have relatively high importance in our modeling process, indicating both the spatial distribution of built environment amenity accessibility and equitable service to a variety of groups is necessary toward accurately predicting transit ridership. Um, and now uh, we chose some equity indicators in our web app. Um, so we'll get to those in a little bit, but these are maps of the spatial distribution of those indicators. So first, starting with a racial distribution of uh, the city of El Paso, um, because we aim to measure equity to assess um, access to transit for all populations, we see there's a pretty noticeable clustering of certain populations, um, particularly whites in the eastern suburbs, the Hispanic Latino population um, toward the east and to the north and southeast, the black population to the north, Asian population in the northwest and north, and overall population density in downtown the north and the east. We also thought it was important to highlight the disabled population and their ability to have access to transit. And it appears there are several spots throughout the city that have a somewhat increased density of disabled individuals, but the distribution is relatively sporadic. And there is a slightly um, positive correlation between uh, disabled populations and total ridership. Moving into median household income, we see that the further you kind of sprawl out into the city, um, there is kind of an increase in median household income. And again, um, a negative correlation um, slightly between total ridership and median household income. And finally, this map um, illustrates the diversity of employment types to occupied housing units, which is scored on a scale of zero to one. This is a useful metric looking at both ridership and equity because areas of increased household occupancy and employment opportunity may increase ridership demand. Uh, the maps reveal that the Northwest region extending towards the East and downtown exhibit higher scores for these metrics. Cool. So now we jump into the modeling process. Uh, as stated before, we built a latent bus transit demand model to predict ridership in each X bin. We experimented with a handful of models, but ultimately chose to work with the XG boost model 
as it was a strong option for handling our nearly 150 features while also producing a low mean absolute error of 36.4. The scatter shot, the scatter plot shows the actual versus predicted ridership. With an R squared very close to one, one could consider this overfitting, but we discuss this in a generalization process. So here's the actual verse predicted uh, mapped, and they look very similar. So we'll look at the errors between the two. Uh, we see uh, we overestimate in certain sections in downtown while underestimating uh, uh, along the Brier routes and also notably the El Paso Chinchilla Stadium. We did not factor that into our model. Um, to look at generalizability, we split all the hexagons based on uh, total population quintile. And so we see that the mean absolute error uh, is lowest and the lowest population quintile, which makes sense. If there's less population, then there's less error in the ridership and the predictions of the ridership. Uh, but it is interesting that the MAE is uh, sorry. It is interesting that the MA is lower for the most populous group compared to the second most populous group. And so we use the predictions from this model to feed into our web app. Uh, yeah, so the user of the web of our web app is the Sun Metro Transit Planner. So that's Alex. If you're watching, this is you. Uh, the objective is to understand how a new bus route performs based on the ridership and equity factors, and we'll display, we'll show how we upload a route to the web app to derive projected ridership and equity. So Ying Chu in the back will be controlling this. This is our beautiful web app. Uh, we'll close out of the instructions because we will be giving you the instructions. Uh, so yeah, if you click on the predicted ridership button, you can see the hex grid overlaid on the map. And you can hover over each of the hexagons to get the current ridership and the predicted ridership. Uh, yep, if we pull up the current ridership button, that will show all of the routes and we can filter for a certain route. And when we filter for a certain route, it zooms in onto the specific route and then in the dashboard here, uh, sorry about the borders being a little misaligned, but it gives jitter plots and scatter or box and whisker plots for the economic and equity factors, uh, with each dot being a different route in the overall network. Uh, and the line shows uh, where this highlighted route falls in that. Uh, so you can compare a specific line to the rest of the network. And so this leads us into uh, the most important feature where we can import routes uh, via GeoJSON. So the planners will have their prepared GeoJSONs of potential new routes. And we select this one. It'll take a second to load in. Uh, we see the points already, but the graph is loading. Yep, and so we have that loaded in. And now we can see how this new route fares uh, versus all the other routes already in the system. Uh, and we have a couple different samples. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you. I appreciate the silliness. Always get bonus points for being silly with me. Um, questions? Yes. Good job. Um, I thought your dashboard was really cool and very detailed. I was wondering, is it up to the user to look through that and decide what route is best? Or is there like a ranking system or it's really up to, it's more like complex than adding up everything, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's up to the user to import the new routes and just based on that dashboard, make the decisions. Uh, yeah, we're not creating a ranking of however uh, new routes, yeah, would rank compared to each other. It's you have to look at the dashboard and make decisions. 
But thanks for the question. Any other questions? Yes. Um, would you mind explaining a little bit what scenario A and scenario B is? Yeah, so um, we, we presented three scenarios. Um, these are basically just kind of like proof of concept routes um, that we just uh, created ourselves. I'm um, just to show like the functionality of the app. Um, specifically, one of the scenarios is like a, in the downtown to the north area of El Paso. One is along uh, the Dyer Avenue, which is a uh, one of the Brio corridors. And another one is along the southeast area I was talking about earlier that has low ridership. Um, so there's not, not really any rhyme or reason to them. It's just kind of a matter of like showing like different scenarios, how they fare in comparison to um, the rest of the network and um, just generally shows like the proof of concept evaluation that we're building. Um, um, I, I'm very impressed by all the work you've been doing and the functionalities of that, and especially I really love the graphic design. And um, I'm very interested in how you would interpret uh, modeling errors in this situation because on the one hand like if your predicted ridership is different like for example if your predicted ridership is very different from the real life it could mean one the model is inaccurate in this sense and also it could also mean that okay there is potential ridership but you know for some reason the network is not good enough to kind of bring out these um, ridership that are latent um, so is there a way or or is there any consideration for how to kind of separate these two factors like i can't think of a, i can't think of one like on the fly but yeah uh i did kind of realize last night that uh yeah the ridership is only based on where the bus network actually exists and so it's hard to extrapolate uh to bring bus service to where it doesn't already exist. Uh, I kind of had that realization last night. Uh, a solution for that, a look at the bike share group. They did an amazing job where you click a point and then that point runs into the model itself uh, or that certain uh, cell in the fishnet then gains one uh, bus stop in our case or Indigo station in their case. Uh, so that is yeah, the solution to be able to extrapolate uh, where the ridership could be if a new bus stop was introduced. Uh, one last question. Thanks. Um, is there a advantage to the hexagons over like a square fishnet? I'm just so curious. Yeah, uh, when you make the grid in R, you have an option to make it a square and a hexagon. Uh, I think hexagons are better uh, because they fit together nicely. Uh, I'm a big Settlers of Catan player, and there's a lot of hexagons in that. So, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Well done. Congratulations. Um, let's please hear a round of applause for all of our fantastic groups. Um, I, I have a few thoughts as we close the semester. The first is that I want to thank Jibbe Po for helping with all of you um, and helping you to develop the apps. Uh, I'm really grateful to see some recent graduates come here to support their um, their colleagues. That's really special. Thank you. Um, so you're not students anymore. You're colleagues. So this is very exciting that now we're like professional colleagues. And we've been that way for some time because it, I don't know, maybe the last month or something where you ask us a question, we say, I don't know, you're the expert, you tell me. You know more about this than I do because you've been studying it so intently. So um, you've actually sort of crossed that, that river a little while ago, um, but it's nice to have it be formal. Um, I have a thought for you uh, in parting, which is that I think that um, you're entering this field into in a time of extraordinary cynicism about data in our society. And I think you come from a place where you think about um, people, society, and honesty in a way that people don't necessarily when they come to learn data methods from other places in our society. 
So um, I would appreciate it if you go forward and you think about your responsibilities, not just as an individual doing data science, but as somebody who can contribute to the positive uh, impacts that data can have in our society. Because if you don't, what you know and what you, uh, and what you represent professionally is going to be written off along with the rest of it because society will become intolerant of these things and what they can do to our society in a negative way. So in order to defend the value of what you have learned and continue to do the work that you think is valuable, you need to use your voice and you need to set an example. Um, but I have a lot of faith that you all can do that because we've spent a year together now and um, I have a lot of confidence in that. So um, with that, congratulations. Um, Matt, do you have any parting words? Well, one, as far as the job market you're going into, feel free to use me as a resource for, you know, looking at your CV, jobs or whatever. Like, let's be colleagues and do that. Um, second, congratulations on all you've done here. And third, thank you for the semester and letting me work with your creativity, intelligence, and diligence in these projects. Really appreciate it. Thank you.